Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. Have I ever left you, and how can you miss me if I won't go away? Today, in anticipation of getting their asses kicked in the Tuesday night TV fight, AEW partnered with TBS to present the worst wrestling show of all time, and we're here to laugh about it today, along with all the rest of the dreck that we watched. And joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. I don't even have a f***ing bit for this. The great Brian Last, everybody. And I don't have an answer. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again for everything we're going to talk about that we didn't talk about yesterday. Yeah, because I never get rid of you. How can I miss you if you never go away? I'm in one of those moods today, Brian, and I'll have you 30 seconds before we began speaking here today. I had to I had to take a big a big snurf, a big sniff. Not the kind that you think. It's fucking freezing this morning here in Louisville, Kentucky. Wednesday it was 89 degrees. This morning, Saturday morning, it's 42 degrees. And I was out letting Harley take her morning Russo. And I, I wanted to sit down and clear my sinus passages before we begin speaking and talking. And what I forgot was when I took the big, uh, oh, that hurt too. When I took the big sniff, I forgot to take my headphones off because I was already on the, in the process of sitting down to call you. And as a result of the atmospheric pressure being de-equalized, by the combination of my nasal insurge and my ears being covered up, now I can't hear out of my right ear. I sound in my own head like I'm in a goddamn oil drum. Ah, heh, heh, heh. And it won't clear. So we got that going for us today. Oh boy. Well, you've been sick all week, you malingerer. How's your temperature? I mean, I'm still a little sick. I don't have the temperature, though, if that's what you want. I don't have the dew well, points. Well, I'm, 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 I'm expecting more details. I mean, is, is, your, is your goddamn croup cleared up any? Are, are you pooping properly? You don't need any of those details, but everything like that is okay, so I'll give that detail, I guess. You know, just general crumminess. You're just generally crummy. Yeah, and the weather's all back and forth today. It's raining again. The leaves are flying all over the place. But I guess we could describe the wrestling industry as generally crummy, too, with <laughs> intermittent periods of rain and leaves flying around all over the place. Uh, yeah, We're going to talk about everything that we have seen, and some of it in not much detail, over the past week, by the time this program is finished, to the... To the naked ear of the listener, we'll end up with the the WWE's going to be in the fast lane. I thought is Cena in fast lane or Fast and Furious or both? Is he is he as fast as all that? I don't know. Have you ever seen John Cena run a foot race? No. Have you ever seen the Fast and the Furious? No. So we we're completely we're completely unprepared for that. All right, so far, you wanted a hospital story, you fucking malingerer. You wanted a hospital story when I told you on one of these programs we've done over the last week or so that I'd been visiting my cousin Larry in the hospital. You saw, oh, well, you got to tell us what kind of interaction you've had with people. And I said, well, I haven't had any interaction with people. I park in the fucking garage. I slip right in the side door. I go up in the elevator. His room's over in a corner. I don't see nobody. There's no story here. And you were gobsmacked and amazed by that anyway because of all the various checkpoints and clearances and metal detectors and everything you had to go through to the various hospital visits you did. And I believe you have to show your passport up there in New Jersey before you can get in the hospital. And so uh, I had no story. Now I got a story. Because... The hospital that I've been visiting that was such an easy place to access is one of our our fine suburban hospitals here in Louisville, Brian. We've got if you tons of medical care is available in the city of Louisville, and it's all over the place. So it was 
out in one of our suburban hospitals I was visiting, but now that they've transferred Larry down to the rehabilitation facility where they specialize in, you know, helping people get up and about again, it's downtown. Now, I've lived here all my life, but they've been building downtown up a lot, and I don't go down there much. And so I wasn't familiar with that area, so I got the street address, and I know the name of the place and the street address. But I don't really know what that particular block looks like, so I figure when I pull up there, I'll ask somebody or I'll figure out how to park or whatever. I'll take care of it, right? It's almost 20 miles downtown from the house, but that was a snap. But then when I get downtown, I'm on South Floyd Street, and then I got to turn onto a little side street, and it's not that far from Broadway, just so you know. Maybe 45 seconds from Broadway, as George M. Cohan would say. But so I'm in not only a little side street, but I'm in the giant University of Louisville Medical Center. They got hospitals. They got a children's hospital. They got a regular hospital. They got a rehab facility. They got a transplant place. If you got something that you don't want, that you need to get rid of, they'll take it out. And if you're short something, they'll put it back in, all in this one block, right? So by the time I've got the street address of the exact place I'm going to, but by the time I go down this little side street, and see that I'm in front of it, I've already passed where you would, I believe you would turn in to park, I think, because I briefly flashed on a thing that said entrance while I'm looking for this building. Now that I've found it, it's too late. So I flip around in a little access place that the next building has so that I can come back. And when I'm coming back up, I see this lady wearing a uniform. And I've, okay, she's got a uniform. I don't know whether she's law enforcement, traffic enforcement, parking guard, school crossing, but if she's got a uniform, she knows something. So I pull up and I said, pardon me, officer. Where do I park to go in the rehab center here? And she said, well, are you going to valet or self-park? And I thought, well, I don't want to appear to be a fucking snob. I said, I, I can self-park. And she says, well, you go down to the end of the street here and you turn left at the stop sign. Then you go to the next stop light and you turn left there. Then you go down about a half a block till you come to a flashing light. You turn right there. Then you're going to see a sign on the left. I said, I'm valeting. She's, oh, in that case, just pull up past these four cars here and turn in the right. Okay. That was easier than I thought it might be when she first started talking. So I pull up past the four cars, and I turn in, and there's a little sign as the entrance, and as I'm going up this ramp, there's cars parked on the right-hand side, but I see the valet sign, and as I'm pulling up, there's a car there with all four doors open, and it's kind of half, it's halfway in the middle of this area, so I, can't, I ain't going past it. But I see that they're loading in this poor soul that has lost use of I don't know how many of his fucking appendages. And so I'm not going to yell like, hey, hurry up, get out of the way, whatever. So I'm sitting there, and they're loading this guy in the car, and it is a process. I think they're putting him in an Opal Cadet. So they got to they grease him up with Vaseline, get him in the fucking back seat. And then when they pull out, here comes the valet guy. And I said, are you the valet, sir? Yes. I said, well, I'd like to valet. And he said, Are, oh, you have an appointment here? I said, I'm just going to visit. Oh, we can't valet you. I said, what? We, only if you've got an appointment to see one of the doctors or you're paying. Well, then where do I park? He said, well, you keep going to the end of the building here and turn left at the corner. Then you go to the stop sign and you turn left. Then you go through the stop sign and come to the stop light. And you turn left again. Then you, I said, never mind. I said, wait a minute. I'm looking at you. Isn't that... 20 feet behind you, isn't that a parking garage? Just right there next to us? And he said, oh, but that's not ours. That belongs, that belongs to the children's hospital. I said, you mean they let the kids drive? And he said, he, said, he didn't know what to say to that. Yeah, how do you respond to that? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, you know, I realized I hadn't been down here in a while to this medical complex since a long time ago. My mom sent me to a child psychologist. 
but the kid didn't help me at all. So anyway, oh I asked, God. I said, I said, if I'm paying to park in that garage, are they going to be mad? And he's, how are they going to, he said, I, I don't know. He didn't know how to answer. I said, never mind. I'll figure it out. So I go down to the end and I turn left and I go to the corner and I turn left and I go to the fucking stop sign and I turn left again instead of continuing on to the stop light and I get in that garage. And when I say get in, I mean by an inch and a half because as I'm pulling in the thing, I'm in black beauty and I fucking see the sign clear at six feet seven. And I, holy shit, and I pull under the thing that they've got hanging there to see, you know, for the fucking... Uh, the last warning, right? Hanging over the deal where if you bump that, you're you're fucked if you try to go in. And I'm under it. I didn't touch it, but I look out, it's an inch and a half. I'm all fucked. So then I got to go to the seventh level to find a place in this goddamn concrete maze that I can get my battleship in and out of. Then I get in the elevator and I go down to the first floor. Because then I got to go out of the garage and turn left on foot and go up this fucking ramp that I fucking was just up with the valet guy to go in the rehab place where I got to get in the elevator and go to the fifth floor. So by the time it, it took me longer to go from the front of the building to just park and go to the room than it did to drive the almost 20 miles that it took to go from the house to downtown to the building. So once I got there, I had a very nice visit, but it was somewhat, somewhat of a process to get in and out of this place. It's not like you're just gonna, you're not gonna zip. This is not a seven 11. You're not just zipping in and zipping out. It's not, it's not a convenience store. Can you believe they let those kids drive, especially they when they're sick? They don't let the kids drive. It's for their parents and the doctors and the visitors. Well, that was with the doctors and and things were reserved down at the bottom. But up top, it was all these little tiny tricycles. You think the sick, right. the sick kids, they're so sick, but they're riding their tricycles over to the hospital? Well, I see now I've been talking about the state of American health care for I don't know how long. Would and you, nobody will listen to me. nothing to do with things this. Things like this going on. Things like what? The poor kid needs a fucking kidney transplant. He's got to ride his tricycle all the way downtown, and they won't even valet. Where are his parents? That's a good question. I'd like to know that, too. Where's this kid's parents when he's riding his tricycle all the way downtown to get a kidney transplant? That's another thing wrong with this country. The absence of the, the parental unit. In these children's lives. No wonder they're out under the overpass riding their tricycles and fucking skipping rocks in the sewer at two o'clock in the morning. The downfall of American society. Is this what's happening in uh, the greater Louisville area on the news? You see it all the time. Bands of roving children, juvenile delinquents, six, seven, eight years old on these fucking souped up tricycles doing donuts. The street racing thing, they're starting early these days. Personally, I think a, a good law and order party should go into office to take care of this thing. But, but how is Cousin Larry? Cousin Larry's doing better. Thank you very much. Um, we had a nice, it's a, he's more converse, conversational or conversant now. And not sure how long he's he's going to be there at this facility, but he's able to get up and about and into a chair and things and such of that nature. But uh, he remembers shit that went on 50 years ago. So we had a wonderful time. Cause I can't remember anything that's happened since 50 years ago either. So we had a wonderful talk. Speaking of 50 years ago, they didn't have a thing called Jim 50 years ago, but now we are all blessed and fortunate that such a thing has been added to the to the world so that I can spread the joy this holiday season, Brian. Because, of course, already the people know that it was this past Saturday. Today as we speak, but by the time you hear it, who knows when it'll been. But Saturday, October 7th, all the merchandise at jimcornette.com uh, officially went back on sale. The T-shirts, the DVDs, 
By the way, remember the lazy booking t-shirts after this uh, stock is depleted will not be restocked. We're going to go in a different direction next year with some things. So if you have been sitting on the fence about the lazy booking shirts, now is the time. And uh, But otherwise, the action figures, especially the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette 40th anniversary four-pack action figure set, including the book, the autographed photo, and the certificate of authenticity. That is on sale now as it has been for the past month with now all of our other merchandise you can choose from as well. We concentrated on the pre-orders, which have already been begun being mailed out to the, the waiting hands of the consumers. So jimcornette.com, quality merchandise, affordable prices, fix all your holiday shopping lists up in one place, right? And then be done with it. And you don't have to worry about anybody else for the rest of the year. Brian, you've certainly, uh, I, I know you're going to have to have some items for your family, for your children, for your frenemies, possibly enemies. No, I only get a Do you stuff buy for, gifts for people? I get stuff for Suzanne and the kids, sure, all the time. And some of my friends will just randomly get a book sometimes. I'll see something I think they like, and I'll just send it to them. But you didn't say you, you paid for it. You'll just send it to them. You'll I, see I, it. I paid for it. First of all, oh. uh, yeah, I paid for it. If I send it, it's, I'm paying for the postage. If I buy it on Amazon, I'm paying for it. Well, you just you. Did, I wanted to make that clear. You didn't plainly state that. So you do have some type of charitable sympathetic gift giving bone yes. in your body somewhere remember that gift i sent you last year that box of flaming manure on your porch yeah i have a feeling i've i've probably paid many times over for the things you've sent me <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right um they're gonna have a tuesday night showdown this coming week uh dynamite has been bumped over to tuesday and nxt obviously is on tuesday and of course, a lot of the the uh, trampoline cowboy consumers out there are going. Well, you see, the NXT's loading up the show because because they're afraid to lose to Dynamite. It's not that they're afraid to lose to Dynamite. In my opinion, it's that if if lightning struck and they were to be outrated by a program as pathetic as what we witnessed this past week. I'm sure they would never live down the shame of it all. But that's their night. They're defending their night. So I I don't see that this is any different than any other promotional issue, either in the territory days or in the modern era, in that, well, well go well, ahead. That, that's interesting, though. You see this as defending their night, not necessarily trying to hurt AEW as much as just defend their night. Because people see this as, you can't say they don't hate AEW. Look at what they're doing. How do you see it? Well, what, how I see it is not only, again, the shows have just fallen apart. The TV pro, as a professional television program of any description, this past Wednesday was embarrassing. And I think not only would it be embarrassing if even the developmental program, in, it was even to be tied by this fucking flaming mess, but also, they're in the middle, the WWE being they, too many pronouns, pal, of the media rights negotiations, and blah, 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 we just established from their releases here a week or two ago. SmackDown is off Fox, it's going to USA, but does that mean that Raw and SmackDown are off USA? I still don't know. If, if the if one place said definitely, another it, it's still open. Anybody could buy the fucking things. But the point is, they want to pump these numbers up. And I was talking about them doing this with NXT four years ago when it was a Wednesday night deal and it first got started. And I didn't know why they didn't, they being WWE, didn't put more of their star power against AEW early on because they wanted... Remember they did that horrifying Nickelodeon kaleidoscope pastel color bullshit for a while. But this is a whole new corporate entity and they're in the middle of big time media rights. And where we are talking 
Fucking how many figures is a billion dollars? I've lost track of that. Big money for Raw, for SmackDown, for NXT. They're going to have network specials on NBC. So besides the fact that they want to pump these numbers up, and they've already been doing crossovers. Becky Lynch did a million viewers and a quarter on NXT. They've had numerous of the, the uh, main roster people come down. This ain't going to be the end of it either because they're hot-shotting these numbers to make it more valuable to bilk another... Well, I'm not saying bilk because it'll be worth it because, fuck, some of these networks, have you seen the programming? They need a million people these days. But it's going to be like when Jim Barnett sold Australia. NXT is going to have their rights sold, and all of a sudden all the other people are going to go back to the main roster. Well, that may happen too, but nevertheless... <laughs> The point is that in here's the thing, the WWE television, because there's so much of it and the, and especially raw is so long. They bore us to tears. If you have to watch the whole thing in real time, but they have the stars and you can remember when they do something really impactful because they're not doing it a hundred miles an hour for the whole fucking show. AEW, meanwhile, bores us because everything is so fucking chaotic that you can't tell one thing from another and it's just going by like the goddamn interstate fucking scenery. But And they don't have as many stars, as many viewers, or the mainstream recognition as being the, the wrestling show. So in a battle of boredom, the stars and the more professional product We'll win out every time. Sorry. If you're going to be bored to fucking tears, you at least want to recognize and like some or most of the people that you're watching and be able to hear the goddamn interviews, be able to DVR the show on a proper schedule, be able to goddamn watch the whole thing without them not being able to manage their time and running all over the fucking place. When Raw had a run over, it was in the fucking schedules. They just have run overs because they can't get their shit in. So I'm just telling you, it's not. And the, the numbers for NXT on Wednesday have been comparable to AEW on Tuesday to begin with already over the last few weeks. They're souping this thing up to get billions of dollars out of networks over at the WWE. And AEW's network, it was 30 years ago that fucking TBS played the previous week's program on the WCW Saturday Night Show, and that's when they fired, goddamn, what was the director's name? It had been there for ages, and they fired him over it. I can't remember. Edwards. What was his first name? Blake. No, goddamn. Nevertheless... They still can't fucking get their shit together over at TBS after all these fucking years. And ah, ah, in a battle of boredom, the stars will win. I do like the idea of Blake Edwards producing WWE, though. It's an interesting concept. But let's uh, talk about Tuesday night. The um, I guess the reigning champion, the person who lives on Tuesday, NXT. So far, they've announced... A breakout tournament for women will continue. Oh, boy. Also, Becky Lynch... I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't lead with that. And Becky Lynch is, is, is supporting that lead? Holy shit, I'd well, have led with Becky, maybe. Well, I, again, this is not an official thing. I'm just going on some shitty website I found because no one has just a lineup anywhere. It's not <laughs> easy to find these fucking idiots. But anyway... Becky Lynch. We're both, in, we're both in one of those moods today. Becky Lynch is the women's champion. Dominic Mysterio or Mysterio. I can't even speak today. Do I hear an echo? Is the North American champion. Also, we'll have Asuka versus Roxanne Perez. Cody Rhodes will ah. deliver a major announcement. Ah. Some think he's pregnant. Also, Carmelo Hayes with John Cena. Versus Braun Breaker with Paul Heyman. Oh, yeah, baby. What do you think of that? Yeah, you, baby. What do you think of Heyman with Braun Breaker? 
I think Paul Heyman is once again latching on to the next big thing. Look at it. He got he, with with intermittent pit stops. He went from Brock Lesnar to CM Punk to Roman Re to Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns in that back and forth, and now to Braun Breaker, because they know not only is he the best cunning linguist in the game today, Paul Heyman, but also he's a fucking psychological genius, and he can teach this fucking guy like he's taught these other guys what's going on. I love it, in other words. And Carmelo Hayes, we've heard a lot of good things about recently. In fact, a lot of listeners have asked us to watch the match with him against Ilya that just took place last week, I guess. Yeah, and and, and honestly, I would have done a number of things this past week, and I actually called some people on the phone for all of you who might be listening, who might be mad at me, if I hadn't been otherwise occupied. But I, I love Ilya and anything he does, so I would like to see that from that side also. But nevertheless. If NXT is a good show, is this something we want to monitor a little more? It seems like it has evolved a bit in the last year and a half or so from when it became completely unwatchable. There's been you some know, turnover. It, it, at least it's shorter than Raw. I, I want to keep up with what's going on with the bloodline and the Judgment Day like everybody else does. Um, since that's pretty much the only thing that, you know, you want to live for anymore on these programs, but, um, maybe we can just read the written recaps off the internet and we'll, we'll say Tuesday night, which show will impress us. And if, well, we, we know we're going to be impressed in one way by AEW. It makes an impression, but, uh, we'll see if NXT tickles our taint enough to want to come back for more. Well, let's see if this uh, gets you in the mood. Let's play this before we go to the AEW lineup. Here's Paul Heyman talking about being in Braun Breaker's corner. It looks like he's lost weight. Let's go to this. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Heyman, and I, I just want to make sure I, I got this straight. Next week, live on NXT, for the first time ever on cable television, Carmelo Hayes and Braun Breaker will renew their storied rivalry. Now, this is the same Carmelo Hayes, uh, Mello, that is accepting <laughs> advice from the second greatest of all time, John Cena. The, the same John Cena that keeps getting involved in bloodline business, which means the bloodline has to reciprocate. So the greatest of all time, your tribal chief, Roman Reigns, has bestowed upon me the task and the privilege of providing wisdom to Braun Breaker. Not through a television screen, not on a telephone, not long distance, no. Up close, in person in Braun Breaker's Corner next week, live on NXT. And by the way, he was backstage or in some location and they were playing that to the crowd and the crowd was reacting to it and that was the audio. Because I didn't see this. I haven't seen video. I just heard it. But that, I've just described it, haven't I? Uh, it appears he may be out back because there's like the trucks and everything around him. Yeah, so. but he's not in the building. No, he's not in the building. I hate it. I know, and I know they play the cr they play the the promo to the crowd in the arena, which is fine, and they put it on the PA, which is fine too, so those folks can hear it. But when somebody is as good as Heyman is, I think it takes away to play the audio on television of the crowd. Because I know they're saying, oh, the crowd's reacting, blah, blah, blah. But with a guy like Heyman, it's so good. You're you're drawn in. You want to listen. The crowd is is destroying the effect of his NXT and his inflections and his pauses. It's not necessary. It doesn't add anything to the television presentation when a guy is as gripping verbally as he is. If it's some fucking flummoxed up fucking local yokel. Yeah, pipe in everything you can get. But that didn't need that. But I'll, I'll, uh, the point is, there you go. 
And I'm sure that will not be the last time if, you know, somebody needs to do a, a, a comprehensive medical exam on Paul, make sure he's, you know, his cholesterol has got to be through the roof. One would think his blood pressure is capable of stopping his fucking heart at any point underneath all of that congestive heart failure could be a thing. We need him what is, around. What are you, stop saying these things. Well, we need, well, look at the state of him. We need him around for years and years to groom and 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 manage Braun Breaker as the next Brock Lesnar. He needs to somebody get him on an exercise bicycle. Look at me, I'm I'm fucking. Did I mention I'm three or four years older than Paul Heyman? I weigh, I weigh currently 187 pounds, and my cholesterol is 196. Here's a weird question for you. He's very talented, and he would be no matter what, but. Would a skinny Paul Heyman lose a little bit of the effect? Well, he was he was pretty daggum good before he looked like Alfred Hitchcock. Right, but he's looked like Alfred Hitchcock 25 years, even when he had the ponytail still. He was kind of morphing into this big he's rotund morphing, figure. Morphing into Alfred Hitchcock's hippie nephew. Um, <laughs> I th you know, I think he could drop 50 to 70 pounds and still look like Danny DeVito as the penguin and be healthier. I'm worried about the boy. This is coming from a place of sympathy, from compassion down deep in my heart that I'm afraid that Heyman, the corpulent, greasy, sweaty, overstuffed fucking human goddamn couch that he is, he needs to, he, he's, he, he looks like one of those things you used to fill with sand when you were a kid and try to knock them over, but they would wobble, but they wouldn't fall down. Are we building to a sponsor spot? I don't know. You're just you're tearing no, into I'm, this guy. I'm worried about him. I'm really worried. I'm. I'm. It's coming from a place of deep concern and human love, a platonic love that only uh, two men like us who have have shared wars in the ring together. Remember, I we we've shared our sweat and blood. My sweat and my blood. No, oh, okay. I thought you were still going. I didn't, okay, you stopped no, there. I'm just. Yeah, well, my, I'm trying to think what he he contributed to that besides a couple of potatoes and a goddamn. All right. Anyway, let's go to uh, AEW Title Tuesday. What are they doing over there to combat this? They are celebrating Tony Khan's birthday with a big lineup. Here's what's on the bill. Is this, are you fucking shitting me? What? Is it really Tony Khan's birthday? Yeah, That's the. He said it in the media scrum. Oh, that's right. And is, is that being put out in the promotional materials? Come celebrate the promoter's birthday with us. I have not seen anything yet, I although... I swear to God, that sounds like George Gula saying, hey, we're, we're going on a picnic, Daddy. We're going on a picnic. Or, or Nick said, go to bed, Georgie. Go to bed. There may be a lot of comparisons between Tony and George Gula. Do you know that in, in like 1950 fucking two or something, they put in the Nashville program, I have a copy. In the Nashville wrestling program, they sold at the arena that G little George N George Nick Goulas had taken his first plane ride. All right. What's over there on the W? Yeah, no one's going to be excited about that. That's just to make Nick happy. That that's well, it was a big deal in 1952. But you said, not... You said <laughs> 72. Nobody... No, I said 1952. Oh, 52. I thought you said 72. Yeah. No, so it's even funnier. <laughs> I'm the one that can't hear. All right, well, let's see if you can hear this. Here's the lineup title Tuesday, October 10th. Chris Jericho versus Powerhouse Hobbs. Ooh. My only problem with Hobbs and Jericho is that, hey, <laughs> I, I, I love, and we'll talk about in the program, I, I love that Hobbs is away from QT, and at least he's in the top heel stable. Because Don Fallis is a friend of, of the right people. So that means bigger things for him. But goddamn, he's one of those guys. Can you see like Hacksaw Butch Reed in a Mid-South match getting over, right? Can you see Hobbs treating Jericho like that? And, and is he even going to win this fucking match? Is he going to beat Jericho? Is this a match they should have had? two months from now rather than the next week after the goddamn angle. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The next match, Adam Copeland versus Luchasaurus. 
I'm worried about the health and welfare of uh, and skeletal structure of our friend Edge. Otherwise, I mean, Edge is a, a tremendous veteran pro. Can he have a good singles match with the Lizard? Well, we shall see. Also on the bill, Jay White versus Hangman Page. Oh, good. Just to see Page do a job, I'll put up with White. You think he has to do the job because of the way they're doing stuff with Jay White? He right goddamn now? better. Jesus Christ. If I think Jay White is actually WWE material because he's boring a fuck out of me. Uh, but if they're going to push him and have him lay out the the top fucking the guy in the baby face and the world champion and steal his belt, then yeah, he better be beaten fucking hangnail. Unless MJF causes him to lose to hangnail. All right, the next match, Jim. For the TNT Championship number one contendership, Brian Danielson versus Swerve Strickland. Oh, I thought that okay. was for Collision. Okay, I guess it's for this show. I'm I'm intrigued because Swerve's problem is when he got with Darby or any of his friends that can do all of their floor routines, you know, Nadia Comaneci, Olga Corbett, that crew, it, it's just ridiculous, but he's he looks like a star. He has a good aura, and he can work when when it's controlled into a wrestling match instead of the gymnastics. And I don't think Danielson's going to do a ton of gymnastics. So this could be good. And it's, and it's Danielson. Now, will it, I don't know where are they at? Whose hometown are they in this week? Uh, where will it be? It will be in independence, Missouri. Also a neutral territory, unless Harry Truman is in one of the corners. That's right. So, and actually, it would have been neutral territory also if they'd have done it last week in Seattle, because both of them are from Seattle, or from Washington at least. So, would that have canceled out? Would it have been matter meeting antimatter, and they would have not reacted at all, or cheered both, or what would that have been? Well, fortunately, in independence, they, they, they think independently. So, maybe the baby face will be the baby face, and the heel will be the heel. We can hope. In a Harry Truman International Championship match, <laughs> Ray Phoenix defends his title against John Moxley. Oh, God damn it. And you know, if I could just think of who the Secretary of State was in the Truman administration, I could follow that up with a goddamn humdinger. But it's lost. So now they're going to switch the belt back. Or the, the, and then because we've said this publicly, that was, oh, well, we can't switch it back now, but that has to... Why would you have that again? And had and Moxley's been cleared now. He just had a concussion two weeks ago. Is that the yeah. current time period now for brain damage healing? I eat concussions for breakfast. <laughs> what are you going to do to Felix there, John? I'm going to let him drop me on my head three or four times, and then I'm going to bleed. And then your lifeless body will cover him? That's right. It New chip. <laughs> It's so this is the way that obviously Title one would Tuesday. think Title Tuesday, they'll put the belt back on Moxley because it was a mistake. And there you go. I'm getting off on Ray Phoenix's international, international <laughs> champion because every match you think he's about to die or he's going to kill his opponent. But Jim, well, finally, the uh, only other match listed so far and things could always change. It's Tony Khan. And there's no MJF listed for anything yet as a... At least I don't see anything here. For the Women's World Championship, Soraya defends her title against Hikaru Shida. Have we seen that before or does it just seem like it? It definitely seems like it, and it was definitely maybe a tag match or two, but uh, other than that, I don't remember if we've seen it or not. Can it be, you think by the big pay-per-view, they'll just go ahead and put the belt on Tony Storm and uh, let Soraya go try to find a tan somewhere or something? I don't know. We shall see. And, I wonder uh, how much that cost Tony. Soraya. 
Well, we shall see how much this cost him. Tuesday night against NXT, what's your prediction? Um, each show has their own audience that is not going to revert to the other side. And I don't know that we know currently, because it's been so long since there's been a real head-to-head, -head, what that audience is for either program. I, I, I'm not even going to jump out and say what the numbers are going to be, but I think NXT is going to win. And it's, it's, and here's another thing that this may or may not still be true, probably less so with the AEW bunch, but to some extent, it's always going to be, as Christine Jarrett said, wrestling fans are creatures of habit. And if you change the building or you change the day of the show, or you change the TV station, or you change the time, you lose some people. You can't get around it. And with AEW being on, on the off night, NXT having the home field advantage, the, they're teasing The Undertaker. Um, and the, hey, What's he going to do? Walk out there for five minutes, do his entrance. It'd be better than anything on the other fucking program because it's The Undertaker. That's what I'm saying. To a certain amount of people, stars are always going to fucking win. And so we're going to find out how many people are on the internet for AEW, keep up with the time changes, go along with them, don't worry about what the competition is. We want to watch that program, and we're going to see how many people there are for NXT that say, I already watched every week, but holy shit, you know, these guys, these stars are going to be there, or for the people who say I only watch once in a while, or maybe I've quit watching like us, but all those stars are going to be there. And I predict that there will be more of those for NXT, the incumbent on Tuesday, with the names, than there will be for whatever that the other company can fucking do. Because they're already being handicapped. And then, will TBS broadcast the entirety of the audio, or at the right time, or will they list the fucking thing? Who's going to do an overrun? <sighs> to try to well, get a I mean cheap victory accidentally or on purpose on purpose on purpose nxt accidentally maybe aew well we shall see title tuesday with two big title matches I've, if nxt doesn't overrun and wins i guarantee you if you look at the numbers they'll win without the overrun how do you do you think they start hot I, d I don't know how with what you've talked about that they may have that they're not going to start hot because there's a lot of shit on both those shows to get into two hours. So with so, AEW, based on everything I said, what would you start with? Would you start with the Phoenix Moxley match and try to think that people think, oh my God, the last match was almost a murder. I got to watch this. Uh, <sighs> Again, do you tease the paralyzation or do you, do you send out a star and something they'd care about? I don't know. I ain't going to anticipate what Tony fucking Khan might do. Because I didn't anticipate that on Monday night they would bore us to death either to the level that they did, but this one was especially dreary, except for the, the usual suspects, the high points of Gunther and, to some extent, the Judgment Day and their interactions with people. You were under the weather. And we're not able to, to see this fine program. So would you yeah. like me to fill you in so that you don't get left out when, when something refers back to this landmark occasion and, and, and you're unawares? Uh, for, first of all, uh, I did see some of the show so I can keep up with you. Second of all... Oh, so you can keep up with me. Okay. Even if I missed it, they're going to show me replay packages until the end of time showing me everything that I missed. Yes, they, they will replay episodes er, or parts of Raw more often than the Zapruder film. During the but, ring introductions, they'll just all of a sudden go yeah. to a replay. But uh, it, I, it, the show opened and put me on a down note because they were in the middle of a fight between Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler. And a big brawl, in quotation marks, with the referees and blah, blah, blah. And I wrote, they're seriously going to use her. Fucking refrigerator jacks. 
And then Raquel came out to make the save and accidentally booted Baszler. And then Rhea came out and got on Nia, and the other girls were fighting Rhea too then, and security came in, they had to pull apart. And I'm thinking, my God, they're going to risk Rhea Ripley against this well, I, she she might look like a Sherman tank, but as Tojo Yamamoto used to say about Al Green, maybe he looks more like a septic tank. But anyway, after all that was cleared out, then Rhea does a promo and calls out the Judgment Day because she says, we need to talk. And here comes Priest and Dominic, and I'm like, okay, finally. And they went to the break. Uh, and when they come back, Rhea's already in mid-sentence, so somebody jumped the gun on her cue. Either that or they played an extra commercial on my local facility. But she had just apparently gotten something off her chest, although I couldn't see any difference and noticed nothing lacking. Uh, but the story here they're telling now, and Brian, help me with this if I miss any of the intricacies and nuances, but there's been no leader in the Judgment Day, but each of them has their own responsibilities, and somebody's got to come up with a game plan. But she's saying she's gone for two weeks and the shit has fallen apart. And she left the responsibility to Priest, and apparently he can't handle it. Dominic lost the North American title because Priest wasn't there. And Cody and Jay want the tag team titles. And Rhea is kind of talking down to Damien and more, more obvious than ever before, she's the boss of this bunch, right? And again, she had a baby face. Even though she came out there and got into it with Raquel while attacking Nia Jax, she's the baby face out of all those women. She yeah. got the big pop at the end. And then it was right back into this. They said there's no leader of the Judgment Day. She's the leader of the Judgment Day. Yeah. And she should be. And then Priest, you know, he kind of fired because he's going to eventually be the one and they're doing the slow bubble. But he's going to be breaking out sooner or later. But he says, screw Cody and Jay and everybody else. I've got my belts and I've got the money to bank briefcase. And where's Dom Dom's belt? You know, and so then Rhea looks at Dominic and and she says, hey, I'm mommy and you're poppy, so you better beat Trick in the rematch. See, they're, they're referring to NXT on Raw, which is what they ought to fucking do. Should have been doing more of. They should do that even when they're not hotshotting, you're saying? Yes, yes, because it's all the same company. And the more people that watch these programs, the more money they're going to get for them. So anyway, uh, if he doesn't come home with the belt, he's not supposed to come home. And then Uso's music plays, and Jay comes out and says apparently Rhea Ripley is the new tribal chief and has bigger balls than Roman Reigns. And Priest and Jay go to face-to-face, -face, and then Dominic stopped him, and now they're doing the thing where they're just blatantly turning Dominic's mic off. Have you noticed that? And maybe piping in the booze on top of that well, because yeah, no, it was ridiculous. Well, and, and honestly, now, I don't think they have to pipe the booze because the people know it's a TV thing to do to boo him. But what they're doing is all the, all the crowd microphones where the, the, the interview is not being fed to, they got microphones around the ring and microphones in the crowd. They're just bringing that all the way up and turning his mic down. But now you can't hear him at all to the point where you don't know what he's saying. So it's a little, it's a little much. But anyway, Jay and Dominic face off and Jay super kicks him. And here comes JD McFunco. And the heels two on one Jay. And then Cody's music plays and he hits and make a big save. And the heels bail out. And suddenly Adam Pierce is out there. Just God damn it. We're going to have a tag team title match on the pay-per-view playa. And they did, and they booked the tag title match for the pay per view in in five days on in that little angle there, and we were twenty three minutes into the program at that point. 
At this point, it's a relief when Pierce comes out there and doesn't say, I'm booking a match tonight. When at least you have a few days to think about it, it's kind of nice for once. But it, it, again, all that stuff that they did was good, but... But they it, draw it, it everything out. It taken 23 fucking minutes. No, they, it, it, they draw everything out. Non-stop. Everything gets drawn out way too long. And now AEW is doing it too. And that's a WWE thing. But this took a while. But the Judgment Day are good. And, you know, Finn wasn't there. And I'm not going to have you say anything bad about J.D. McFunko. He's, uh, you know, <laughs> gobba gobba, we accept you, one of us. <laughs> one of us. One of us. But, you know, the Judgment Day, or uh, this was all top-tier people involved in something. Even the Nia Jax thing. Look, if they're going to use her, the only thing to me in the world that's intriguing is the idea of Rhea Ripley body slamming her. That's the only thing I want to see is Rhea Ripley just fucking kill her in the ring. Well, now, now come on. So that now. was a you're, good you're opening. Just, metaphorically You're just speaking. calling for violence. In wrestling, yes. What are you, TBS? You're going to give me a problem by talking about yeah, violence? There's no, there's no room for violence in wrestling. So then Chad Notis and Model Girl wrestled uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Kaiser Wilhelm, and the, the heels won at least. But at, now we're 40 minutes into the program. Oh, uh, apparently on NXT, also Becky Lynch, who's been down there more than once now, that she and Tiffany Stratton had a garbage match. Oh, I saw with, that, yeah. Shopping carts, weapons, arena fighting, a fake barbed wire bat. Because you can't tell me that the WWE let anybody have barbed wire for real. And it was only the highlights, but it looked positively AEW level bad. And I'm going to say it again. The girls' hardcore matches are another of the many reasons that everybody thinks that wrestling is bullshit these days. and Nobody watches this shit anymore. And yes, somebody's going to say, well, Cornette. You just said the ratings were going to... I'm talking about nobody in the scheme of the history of pro wrestling's audience over 125 years. That's nobody right now. Bronson Reed beat Cedric Alexander in two minutes. Poor Cedric. And then we get to the contract signing which they, again, have to do to stretch things out because these things are always good for about 15 minutes of blah, 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 blah. But at least it was Gunther and Tommaso Ciampa. And except for the fact that he wasn't wearing any socks, which made him look even more douchebaggy, does Gunther in a suit look like every picture of an NWA champion from the 1940s? Gunther in a suit looked like a classic wrestler, but it made it work for modern times. But like you said, when he stood up and you look at his feet, it just looked really weird, like off. It just looked it, totally it, off because of the no socks. But but when he was sitting at the table with the Dick York haircut and the, the black jacket and, and tie and the white shirt. The problem is I didn't recognize the no socks until he had just gotten done putting down Ciampa's outfit. I look at the way you dress to come meet me. And then he stands up again. You don't wear yeah. socks. Yeah. You shouldn't say anything. Well, but Tommaso still was. Unless some... you're wearing flip-flops. If you're wearing flip-flops, you could pull it off. But when you're wearing shoes but no socks, it looks awful. I agree with you. But if you'd have been wearing flip-flops at a contract signing, you'd have still looked like a bum. That Jimmy Snooker was quite the bum. Well, but nevertheless, Tommaso did look like very unkempt, un unfashionable. An unmade bed. But nevertheless, um, you know, <sighs> Tommaso did a promo, and he's very good, and I like his work, but it does it seem like that he just comes and goes to get plugged into something every once in a while and, and somebody beats him? I, I don't know that they have done a lot to... To where the people would have some doubt in the match, which we'll talk about later, they actually gave him some. But was this an attraction because of the way they've used Tommaso? Does anybody think he's going to end the reign of the longest running Intercontinental Champion ever? That that you was know, the. <laughs> it is good though that they're now, because it seems at least for now they've moved on from the Gable thing, and I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying they gave that a few weeks. They made it serious. It didn't work out. He's on to his next opponent. 
I like that they're kind of making each opponent a serious thing now for him. Well, I don't, and and they, I, I'm not saying they shouldn't do that. What I'm saying is they should make each opponent a more serious thing for him by making his opponents more serious first. Why didn't they have Tommaso out there for the last four or five weeks while he was interacting with uh, Gable just beating people every week? But the other problem... Well, the problem I know too we, is, I know we missed a raw, and I know that we skipped some things that are just blah. But I usually keep an eye out for Champa, and I haven't seen a repeated weekly push of Champa to make him an intercontinental champion or continental title challenger for you know for a TV main event. See, he looks like he could be like crazy in a fight and kick some ass. He looks like he's from like a homeless encampment. He looks like he's got this look, and then he gets on a mic, and what does he say? Not. I'm going to kick your ass. He says, this is my childhood dream to be the yeah. Intercontinental well, Champion since I was five years old. That Everyone's was another doing thing. that promo. Everyone is doing that promo. That's, that's the other thing is that it's not, again, like you said, it's about my childhood dream to do this because they're still, or Vince is still mimicking his push of Shawn Michaels' childhood dream in 1996. But it, that, yes, it's correct. Tommaso, and he's a badass and he's in, incredible shape for real as well as looking the part and he was trying to put oomph in this but it yeah he doesn't look like a guy that you would care about his childhood dream nevertheless and uh they milked around and then Tommaso said because I wrote this is taking a while Tommaso tells him to sign the contract I wish he would and then Tommaso says, they don't have to wait. We can do it tonight. And Gunther signs the contract, and it'll take place tonight. And then Gunther slaps him, and Tommaso tackles him, and they have a fight, and Gunther rolls out. And that took a while. But we got the match later on. Um, Ivar the Viking wrestled Xavier Woods. That was a real rip snorter. As soon as I heard that New Day music. Fast forward. Yeah, so Seth Franklin Rollins, did you like the promo? Did you do you know what I really, really, really didn't like about this long, rotten segment with Seth Franklin Rollins and Shaky Nakamura? Well, you hate Nakamura sometimes unfairly, so I'm gonna guess you're gonna say him, but I actually fast forwarded through this whole thing because Rollins has go away heat on the mic with me. Okay, well let me tell you, no, it 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 wasn't shaky that I hated, it was his twin brother, Quakey. Because, see, there was two of them. You missed this. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I don't know where you I don't going. know what the fuck they were trying to do to talk to me about. <laughs> Shaky and Quakey. Because <laughs> there was Seth doing the promo, and he came out, and he's dancing, and he's cackling, and he's doing whatever this fucking gimmick is. And then he has a promo about they're going to have a last man standing match i believe uh with old shaky nakamura on the pay-per-view this weekend that we're about to finish this program by talking about and i i was wondering if this rivalry was longer now than bobo brazil and the sheik because it will not end but then suddenly another nakamura video comes up on the screen with the subtitles he's speaking japanese you're reading it in english and I, I wrote, I don't care if he cures cancer, they cannot make people believe that Shaky Nakamura is a main event world champion guy right now in this day and age. But here's what happened. As the video on the screen of Nakamura was playing, guess who jumped in the ring from behind and attacked Seth Franklin Rollins, Brian? Was it Quakey Nakamura? It was his twin brother, Quakey Nakamura. Because Quakey jumps on Seth and beats him up and gets him down. And as soon as that happens, Shaky on the video screen starts counting to 10. And he's illustrating that, that old Seth Franklin is going to be down for the 10 count. But he counted to seven and Seth got up. So then Quakey got back on him, 
and hit him nine times with a chair. And then he folded the chair out and sat in it, did Quakey, while Shaky on the screen started counting again. Brian, can you tell me what's wrong with this so far? If this was a real thing that was happening? Well, I can't tell you what's right with it so far, so why don't you tell me what's wrong with it? How the fuck did the fucking guy, if even if he pre-recorded this and bribed the, uh, the video guy and the truck and the whole nine yards, how did he know how long it was going to take him and or indeed whether he would be able to incapacitate Seth Franklin Rollins to start counting on him, and how does he know how to stop counting when he gets up? So then... He's a genius. As he was sitting in the chair, Shaky on the screen counted to nine, and Seth got up. So Quakey beat him up some more, and then Quakey got on the microphone and counted to ten. You know what? I didn't watch that. I skipped over it. You just said what happened. I still have no idea what happened. <laughs> the guy on the screen, who was the same guy that was in the ring beating up the other guy, was counting on a pre-taped promo for what was happening live in the ring in front of the people, and nobody saw anything wrong with that fucking logic. And everything was matching up perfectly. I'll reiterate one of my biggest fears that I mentioned on the drive through that Punk comes in and they put him with Rollins. Oh, Jesus. All right. Back to Raw. My next note says they had girl versus girl and girl won. Okay, now you're just being completely dismissive of the women's division. Who was in a well, match? I don't know. I don't remember because we were two hours into this thing and I was going out of my mind. What color hair did they have? I don't remember. If you at least know the hair color, I mean, everyone has a different color hair. No one can have the same color hair. Let me, let me tell you something. I couldn't tell you if they were wearing clothes or naked. All right. So anyway. Maybe I have to through, go back and check. Drew McIntyre did an in-ring promo, and I wrote endless talking on this program. And now he's... He, I, I don't know whether they're milking a heel turn or he's just becoming a lone wolf vigilante type. He won't forgive Jey Uso. But then the Miz comes out and he's mad because Drew ruined Miz TV last week and Drew told him to bugger off. Now, for those of you from L.A., that would be lower Alabama, bugger is the English word for fuck. So I'm wondering if they're going to have an issue with that, either potentially if it was beamed to the, to the United Kingdom or if, if it aired in, in this country in a various, you know, British enclaves of some kind. But Drew asked the Miz to fight. Miz said they weren't dressed because they were both wearing, well, Miz was wearing a suit. And I wrote, can anyone shut up? And then Drew started taking his clothes off See, now, I, I made a note of that. I can't tell you about the girls, yeah, but... Paid attention to the naked men, not the women. Well, that's because they were starting to fight, and they had to remove their laundry in order to strip down, like, men and competitors. But Miz said he was going to be the bigger man and walk away. And he did. And then he ran back and nailed Drew with the microphone, and they had a 10-second fight, and the referees came in, and Miz bailed out on the floor, and we went to a break. And I wrote, how does the live audience in the arena bear this? So when we came back, they actually had a match with Drew against Miz in his suit. And they went three or four minutes, and Drew, instead of giving him the, the big kick, he gets his sword. And apparently he was going to run Miz through, I'm not sure, but the referee took the sword away. And while the referee was carefully handling the sword or handing the sword out to the sword handler, I don't know who was taking it, McIntyre ripped the turnbuckle pad off and ran the Miz into it and then double-arm DDT'd him. One, two, three. 
and then immediately got the microphone and apologized for his actions and sarcastically said, that means he's forgiven. So is, is Drew going to be a, a heel with a, he's, he's a pissed off baby face that's been wronged and he can't get over it. Now he's going to be a heel or is he just a lone wolf or possibly a sad sack or does anybody care? He's boring to me right now. They got to do something different. And I like The Miz a lot more than I like Drew McIntyre right now. I think The Miz has had a better run lately and is more entertaining out there. With Drew, it's just, there's a general blandness that comes through with everything he's done. Maybe a heel turn and some slight changes in his gimmick. Like you said, make him more of a lone wolf, whatever that is. Arr! But he's boring as fuck right now. And he has been for a while. I think. Well, I mean, it fits right in here in this program because it's not like, you know, all right. But anyway, the one thing I wanted to talk about about the whole television program was Gunther and Champa, the match at least for the Intercontinental title. And they actually got to this thing and gave them some, the entrance, the break, and the introductions only took seven minutes. So <laughs> at least they gave them, you know, some time at the end of the program. And I love it. I wrote, it's the first thing in three hours I've wanted to see on this thing. And I, I like Champa's work and he was very aggressive at the open. And obviously we've talked about Gunther is brilliant. And again, this was the, the Gunther match and the philosophy with Gunther's in control because he's physically dominant, but Champa fights from underneath. But at the same time, once that you're seeing it in front of you, even if he hasn't had a push, you can buy Champa with his rip physique and his look and his work is so snug as a badass. So they got the people into this at the end, even though I, I don't know that anybody would say that they were jumping up and down at the beginning like this is going to be the moment that Gunther meets his Waterloo. I guess Napoleon, Napoleon, Napoleon met his Waterloo I guess, what would Gunther meet? Nimoleon. The bunker? Maybe he'll meet Namolian. Namolian. I'd pay a Simoleon or two to see that. So he's a, anyway. He's a French mole. It's a quick uh, cartoon man. series we just came up with. Namolian, the Nimo French mole. <laughs> Trademark. <laughs> anyway, um, they ended up, they built it up. They went through a couple of breaks, but by the time they really kicked into it, it was a slobber knocker. And it, they did the deal where Gunther really worked Champa over, but on the floor they go out, he goes for the big chop, and uh, Champa ducks, and Gunther breaks the desktop with the chop and hurts his hand. And Champa makes a comeback there and hits a widow's bell and a two count. And then Gunther took back over and got a, they had a few falses back and forth. But they're, they were getting the people with Tommaso's false finishes because they looked so good and they built the match and it made sense. It looked like it might be the fucking finish. And then, they, you know, they did a rope break where Tommaso got the the stretch and cranked it and Gunther got the ropes and that was like, oh, from the people. And then they did the chop fight, but with Gunther selling his hand but having to use his big weapon and doing damage to himself at the same time, Tommaso goes to lift him, but his back gives out. Gunther hits two power bombs real quick and gets the sleeper and puts him out. And they, uh, again, a, a heck of a match, and it elevated Champa, at least in the fans' eyes, people who saw that. If they continue this, this push, then, you know, they may can get somewhere with Tommaso. But then uh, Kaiser and uh, da Vinci roll in and they attack Tommaso while Gunther is like leaving him to, you know, leaving the bones to his minions. Ha! <sighs> ha! <sighs> and here comes Johnny Sameface and Gargano gets in the ring and beats up the heels and clears the ring and has made his triumphant return from wherever the fuck he's been. We ain't missed him. And again, you have this fucking insurance sales-looking nerd hit the ring, this microscopic 
ant of a man with his plaster of Paris facial expression, and he's saving a badass like Tommaso Ciampa. Yes, I know they were affiliated in NXT, and that was a mistake too. Anytime anyone has ever put Johnny Gargano in a fucking wrestling ring, it's been a mistake. And now he's back. And he's not even 10 pounds heavier. And the fans weren't really that, you know, excited to see Johnny Gargano return. They barely care about Champa. And that's, and again, this wasn't the NXT audience, which is the only place that Gargano's ever meant anything because they force fed him to a select group of the same people every week and he got responses. And that may not even be the current NXT audience. That was the NXT audience four years ago. I don't, I'm, I don't know what audience is there for Johnny's same face, but I've just thrown that pad of paper far away, but it has to be a limited one. He, he would look perfect in AEW, and that's not a compliment. Huh, your closing thoughts on the Raw program, my dear Brian. I like the Judgment Day stuff. I was surprised they did not have Cody come back out at any other point in the show and really do anything. That was really surprising to me, actually. But the Gunther Champa stuff... No, actually, you know what? He did come out and cut a brief promo in the entrance way and then left and said nothing. I missed that. When was that? It was earlier in the show. I didn't even see that. He said nothing either. It was, it was pointless. But I thought the Champa... Gar um, not Gargano. The Champa gunther stuff was good, other than the fact that now we're going to get, I guess, Gunther Stooges against Champa and Gargano, which... I'm not excited about that. And I like the Judgment Day stuff. The intrigue that's now going from show to show with whatever's going on with the Judgment Day, I like that. If it could just happen a little bit quicker. Yeah. Just a little quicker. Like maybe, you know, in every, every three-hour Raw would, would make a good hour TV show. But nevertheless... You know, because here's the thing. Things have to be comfortable and they've got to fit, Brian. You can't put a square peg in a round hole. And that's what it feels like whenever Raw is applied to me every week. It feels like a square peg going into my round hole. I want comfort. I want cuddliness. I want things that fit properly. And you can get all these things from our brand new friends and brand new sponsors, the fine folks at Marine Layer. Now, that is not a place to hide submarines, not lair, ladies and gentlemen, lair, marine lair, L-A-Y-E-R. They are a fine company based in the San Francisco area that markets and manufactures and sells and possibly even gives them away every once in a while. Some of the finest and stylish clothes and t-shirts and accessories and things and such of that nature that you will ever find in your little pee picking dreams. And I've actually gotten some. Have you gotten your box yet? No, you got it and I didn't. And I was really looking forward to checking out the well, clothing. You're going to, they've sent it to you. It's just because you live out in the wilds out there. It takes a little longer. They got to bring sunshine in on a flatbed truck in your neighborhood. It's easy to get things to me. I'm not that far from the greater New York area. Yeah, well, I don't know how great it is, but nevertheless, I got my marine layer box and I'll have you know, I, I, Got a few things that I thought the whole family here would be interested in. Even though I don't travel anymore, Stacy on occasion does go home, as we've mentioned, and visit her family or takes a little vacation here and there. Get away from and you. I, to get away from me. And and I got her this incredible travel bag. Well, you don't have, you could stay home. You could just go across the street, but you can put all kinds of things in this. It's a fine quality piece of merchandise i got one of those also i got for her and this is the the, the main thing here these incredible t-shirts they've got the most comfortable you know i have a lot of t-shirts in my in my closet brian that i've had for years and i've washed a million times and i've just got them to the point where they're nice and comfy but they've also because they're so old they've got various holes and rips and stains and tears and shreds, and knife wounds. Knife and, wounds? Well, just a few, but thankfully not in any sensitive areas. And so they don't look good to wear out. So what I'm trying to find is I'm trying to find a soft T-shirt 
that feels like I've washed it a million times, but it still looks new and, and is brightly colored and, and has no blemishes or defects. And that's what they're doing here. I got a t-shirt for Stacy, a Grateful Dead t-shirt, a poster at the Oakland Coliseum. She's actually been there to see the Grateful Dead. So that was a little piece of home. And then I, for myself, because, you know, I told you it was cold this morning. And I'm thinking about, you know, my, since I lost all the fat, I get cold in the wintertime. And so I got this beautiful fleece. I don't know if you'd call it a sweatshirt or a long sleeve t-shirt, but it's fleece and it's soft and it feels like duck feathers and little baby chicks butts all over my body. All over my body. I just put it on and instantly I just arouse myself because it's so soft and they fit perfect. Even I have to tuck a few of my folds in various places, but that's with all clothing, frankly. So they've even got sizes like Marge. You know what Marge is, don't you, in a, in a sizing uh, a situation? I've never heard of that, no. Marge is in between medium and large. So everybody can get the, the perfect fit. What's between large and extra large? Zarge. <laughs> See? You got me. You got got me. you there. <laughs> but again, Marine Layer. They've got the t-shirts that feel so good and they fit perfect and they're unisex too. If you wear these, you can have sex with anybody and it's still morally all right. No, that's not what that means. Unisex means you have sex on a unicycle. Oh, I'm sorry, then never mind. And it goes way beyond t-shirts because they got the overshirts. I guess that's like an overlord shirt. Overshirts, the pay, you wear them over other shirts, possibly. I don't wear but one layer because I, I am a free perspirer. But nevertheless, they got pants, they got jackets, they've got all kinds of stuff. And when you want to get rid, this is fascinating to me. When you want to get rid of your old T-shirts, they'll literally pay you for them with their T-Respun program. Huh. And you got to find out more about that. And since I have boxes and boxes of T-shirts in the attic, I'm afraid I may be about to retire off these son of a bitches. Anyway. Wait, they'll buy your old T-shirts off you, not just like their brand of t-shirt and no t -shirt? that's what's that's well if you want to get rid of your old tees it says right here oh, we need wow. to find out more about that yeah that's interesting because i'm telling you I'll, I'll go to the landfill and find some old t-shirts but nevertheless if you think the perfect t-shirt can be hard to find look no further than marine layer and right now try them out go to marinelayer.com and look at all the fine clothing and accessories that they've got available and make your own decisions, but I'm sure you'll agree with us that you can get 15% off with the code JCE15 at marinelayer.com. So you're not even looking at the retail price. You're looking at 15% off your entire order, not just one or two things. Get everything. If you can get everything on their roster and get 15% off, you would save dozens of dollars. MarineLayer.com. The code is JCE15. 15 15% off your entire order at MarineLayer.com. They're saving your closet one shirt at a time. And they don't know what I've got in my closet. Once again, Marine Layer. What's the promo code, Jim? JCE15. But Brian, that's if you want to be comfortable and stylish. But before we go to what I assume is the most nightmarish fever dream that I have ever had, AEW Dynamite, you've got some classic audio for a kind of a palate cleanser, a little thing between courses. That's right, and this went over so well on the drive through so we're going to do it again where we briefly hear some classic wrestling audio, maybe something you've heard, something you haven't heard, and we hear it in its context and either laugh at it or listen to it and then talk about it. But let's go to this. From December 31st, 1983, WWF All-Star Wrestling, Victory Corner, with Vince McMahon as the guest. In a moment, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take you to associate publisher Robert DeBoard and Victory's Corner. What we do, we'd like to state that the views expressed in Victory Corner, those of Victory Magazine alone, and its associate publisher, Robert DeBoard. With that in mind, we take you now to Victory Corner, and if I do say so myself, 
is very special. <laughs> Their music was so cheesy back then. Thank you very much, and welcome to Victory's Corner. This week, we're honored to have with us the voice of professional wrestling, Vince McMahon. Vince, a lot of our readers want to know, because of how close you are to professional wrestling, uh, what you see on the horizon for 1984. Talk to us a little bit, tell us a little bit about um, what, what you see coming up, what, uh, who you see might, uh, what titles you might see changing hands. Again, from an announcer standpoint, um, I must say from a fan standpoint, because I consider myself uh, one of the greatest wrestling fans ever as far as interest in the professional wrestling is concerned, I see 1984 as being perhaps the most turbulent year in professional wrestling. I think that with the recent happenings that we have seen as of late, it would point toward a direction of a lot of turbulence, a lot of unusual things happening in professional wrestling, and it would probably open the gates for a, a virtual flood of wrestling talent into the World Wrestling Federation, the likes of which we've never seen before. I think that uh, many, many things would point to an indication that uh, indeed the, the possibility of the, the turbulence that I mentioned would certainly be forthcoming. Uh, we're all looking forward to another year of professional wrestling and uh, your, your continued great announcing. Uh, with that, we'll go back to ringside. Thank you very, Thank much, you very much, Vince. With that, we'll go back to you. What do you think of Vince talking about what he sees ahead for 1984, the year his expansion went into overdrive? Well, and that's the thing is, I guess we should have mentioned before we even played the clip that almost nobody, 99.8 or 9% of the people watching wrestling and especially watching WWF wrestling at that time, thought that Vince was just the announcer. He was not publicly named the owner of the company or the, you know, blah, blah, blah. His father had been, but there was nothing at that point. Hey, Jack Tunney was the president of the WWF back then, or was he yet? Who was the president? Shinma. Shinma. That's so they didn't even use the, the president on TV because it was still the one of the deals they made to get the Inoki booking deal right um but anyway they didn't know who he was and there he just did a complete double speak that nobody could have interpreted as meaning anything because it was just gaga at the time but what he was actually doing was saying yeah it's going to be turbulent because i'm going to fuck everybody's fucking business up yeah why would and i'm going to why would he put this on tv who's this message to i think it was just to him I think he just said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll do this." I'm gonna, yeah, and and he's saying, "I'm gonna raid all the talent. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna expand. I'm gonna go after everybody else's promotion. The turbulence, the influx of talent to the WWE. He knew exactly what he was gonna do, and he said it there. But it was so incomprehensible the way he said it that you would only understand it with the historical knowledge." The turbulence will lead to an influx of talent the likes of which we've never seen and things that are very unusual for wrestling. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. And he told us. It's we and that's the weird thing about it. It's almost like, watch this. I'm gonna go say <laughs> I'm gonna say it without saying it. And and I who was uh, interviewing him? Robert DeBoard. That what he was one of the um the early incarnation of uh, it was victory magazine right so victory right. corner it's supposed to be victory corner if you notice they both actually called victories. it victories <laughs> victory's corner cuz did that come from rogers corner it was rogers corner and then when buddy rogers slipped backstage at the garden before the tag match with him and snooker against i think albano and morocco yeah uh was it morocco i think it was uh he slipped backstage and he sued, I think, the Garden, and maybe even sued the WWF. Just sued everyone that was near him when he slipped backstage. <laughs> so Rogers Corner became Victory Corner, and then Victory Corner became Piper's Pit. Good Lord, but, well, thankfully, old DeBoard had a short run there, because, and he had no idea what Vince was talking about, because he Vince would not have shared that with that low level of a guy, you know, doing the that incarnation of the magazine. That was all for Vince. There, what, at that time, who would have known what he was going to do? Maybe his dad didn't know the extent of it. Monsoon, probably. 
Arnie Skolan, maybe. I don't think Arnie would have cared and Vince wouldn't have gone to him for a lot of help in this project. So almost nobody knew what he was going to do. Did Hogan know at that point? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Had, I, there were certain people who did know because... Well, but I'm saying, what, what at what point was the Japan trip? At what what was the the timeline of that? This is December 31st, 83. So he already had Hogan locked up a few months okay, before I, that. I, I'm sorry. I thought I, I misheard as... Because I only have one ear, as I believe I mentioned before. I thought it was August 83. If it was December, yeah, Hogan was on board. The December, he's already started the process of everything. He already has yeah. Jim Barnett by his side. He already has plans to go into every territory. Okay. Barnett knew, obviously. Oh, of course. This is He's three months after Vince Sr. and Barnett quit the NWA. Yeah, so we've established that maybe five or six people would have known what he was talking about when he put that on his television show. Again, it's such <laughs> a bizarre move for him to do that. Just... You know, we could have a wrestler on there or we could have me on there to say nothing in a weird <laughs> way that no one will understand that I've said it. You know, that that was a, a promotional version of the old Danny Hodge deal where what Hodge and workouts, they would bring aspiring pro wrestlers, college athletes or tough guy, whoever wanted to be a wrestler. And one of the people to work out with would be Hodge. And they said Hodge would tell them exactly what he was going to do to him, how he was going to take him down, what hold he was going to put him in, so they knew ahead of time, and then he'd do it anyway. And there wasn't anything they could do about it. So that's what Vince just did. He told us, kind of, and there wasn't anything anybody could do about it. Well, that was our classic wrestling moment, classic wrestling break in between all the modern wrestling today. Well, boy, talking about some classic shit. If you like classic clusterfucks, of epic proportions, I, again, we teased this at the top of the program, but it's been 30 years since I've seen a television wrestling show on a national basis beset by so many various different kinds of problems, and the last time it was on TBS then too. So we mentioned this on the drive through but let's bring everybody up to date in one place. So somehow... This past Wednesday on October 4th, AEW Dynamite was listed as airing on TBS on the cable guides in Spectrum, and there was another major company, a lot of them, and as airing live from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And the reason that I found out about it was because I think that was an afternoon that I had visited at the hospital and came back in and was going to sit down and watch the weather. And I re I said I saw the DVR light going like I don't, what am I recording at five fifteen on a fucking Wednesday afternoon right And I looked and it was it said it was AEW Dynamite but it was whatever some other program. So then I looked at eight o'clock like I'm sure other people did, and it listed four thirty minute episodes <laughs> of Young Sheldon from eight to ten o'clock. The Sheldon Goldberg story. It's a wonderful story of a young, enterprising man in the Massachusetts area starting on Broadway and doing different things and ending up in the wild and woolly world of Cauliflower Alley. That's to Sheldon Goldberg. We recommend that you watch his life story. But nevertheless, I'm thinking to myself at the time, well, this just can't be right. Because I knew it was coming up that we were going to be on a Tuesday night. I'm like, fuck, did we miss it? And then. I, I said, no, that's next week. And I said, they can't be live at 4 o'clock in the afternoon or we would have heard something about this. So just to be sure, I recorded all four episodes of Young Sheldon that night, right? And then I went to uh, go on to, we had dinner. No, that's why I was going back out to pick Stace up at the airport. And then we came home and had dinner, and it was so late. I uh, was trying to, again, at 10 o'clock, I was still going to watch the weather that I'd missed before going through this procedure. And I said, before I watch the news, I'll, it's two minutes till I'll turn over and, and see if this program is indeed still airing. And that's when Edge was in the ring doing his promo. And of course, they went 
past 10 o'clock unscheduled because of the other technical difficulty they had, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so I, I saw the Edge and Christian interview, confrontation, whatever, live as it happened. But of course, they went till eight minutes after, and I didn't even record it. So the, the, when I'd recorded the Young Sheldons. So the point is, yes, a, a lot of people who would normally watch this program or record it were fucked around by this scheduling thing. And then when they were airing the program, they had technical difficulties. And then they ran overtime over the time period that they weren't even scheduled in, in most places. So even if you DVR'd the program in the places it was scheduled right in, you missed the biggest star that's just debuted doing his fucking deal. Did I encapsulate that fairly succinctly? I think so, and luckily for me, Xfinity did somehow follow along with what was happening and DVR it. However, I missed the last eight minutes or so, so I <laughs> saw, um, I was about to say uh, Christian, it's not even him, it's Edge, it's not even Edge, it's Adam. I saw Adam Copeland, but I never saw Christian. It cut off right before Christian had any involvement. Yeah, yeah, if, if anybody who was out at 10 o'clock saw Edge call Adam calling him out and never saw him, but anyway. Let's start at the beginning, because all great disasters have a starting point. In this episode, they opened the program. They did the pyro, the announcers billboarded the show, and instead of usually they go to the ring, they want to start hot. Sometimes in the past, they've started without entrances. Just, here's a battle royal. Fuck. But in this case, they pitched to a fucking backstage interview to open the show. And it was... Jericho and Twinkle Toes, because now that dream combination has become a reality courtesy of the mutual animosity between them and the Don Fallis family. And Jericho did a little promo. Kenny didn't speak, which was fine. But then in walks... He looked like he was out of it. He looked the same to me as always. I'm not saying you're wrong. And then Edge walked in and shook hands with Jericho. And that's when Harpo stepped in and mush-mouthed a greeting they've never met. And, and there was the sizing up for a second. And then Edge shook his hand and, and left. And then Jericho and Kenny, for some reason, needed to make funny faces. And that was the opening of the program. But I, I'm sure that Tony, in his head, thought, wow, it would be great to get Edge out there as quickly as possible. But fuck, this kind of a blasé open to a fucking show that's got all these other problems going on. And, you know, I watched more of the media scrum than we played here on the show. You poor boy. And it's available on their own YouTube channel, so anyone can access it. And during the media scrum, Edge gushed over the fact he had just met Kenny for the first time. And then <laughs> Kenny and Jericho come out That's right. and do the same thing. We didn't even play that audio, but same thing. They just met him for the first time. So it's a little weird when all of a sudden they're doing this now on TV when it's on their YouTube channel. Again, not everyone's watching the media scrum. But if it's there, you can't ignore it, can you? Well, maybe he was so unimpressed he didn't remember meeting Kenny the first time. Or maybe Kenny really is out or of it. Or maybe know that Kenny, he was there. Kenny was out of it and didn't remember meeting Edge. You never know. Never know. Oh, by the way, so, his name is not Edge. You're not allowed contractually to call him that anymore. I'm not under contract to anybody. I'll call him Dick or Shit or... Why would you go that direction? His name was Edge. If you can't call him Edge, you would go I'll, with Dick and Shit as your I'll next option. I'll call him any goddamn thing I want to call him. I'm not under contract to anybody. I have not promised anything to a soul. Speaking of Dick and Shit, well, this is a bad trip. <laughs> any thoughts on Dick Butkus passing away? <laughs> oh, God. When you said... When you said, speaking of Dick and Shit, I thought you were talking about the next match between Felix and Nick Jackson. I, I, I've, I've never watched a lot of football, but if a guy's bad enough to walk around town all his life with a name like Dick Butkus, he's all right with me. Yeah. 
But then for the dollar store general title, uh, or dollar general store title, Felix and Nick Jackson. He's well, a, I mean, what the... He's a dollar store general? He's a dollar store general, just like a drugstore cowboy. Felix looks like Lex Luger next to Balding Buckaroo. There's nothing there. There's no physique. There's no tan. There's no size. There's no tone. There's no hair. There's no intimidation factor. He's just a goddamn guy wearing a fucking headband. It looks like he's been swimming. <laughs> so by the time that foolishness was off the screen, we were 21 minutes into the program. You didn't watch that match? No. It was ridiculous. They That's why I didn't watch it. They kick out of everything. It's nonstop spots. At times, they're clearly cooperating. I mean, at times. They're clearly cooperating with each other, and it's apparent. But it's just... They're going to do their thing and they're going to kick out of everything. Things that should end the match don't. There was one spot that went viral where he super kicked Ray Phoenix, who went down, then he popped back up and he super kicked him again, popped back up. He kipped up and then he super kicked him. Again. Just keeps popping back up from the super kick. It's just spot, spot, spot. And, and again, uh, in any time period in wrestling that people knew what the fuck they were doing if you told the baby face as a direct order from the the booker super kick him the heel he's going to take a bump he's going to nip up super kick him again he'll take a bump he'll nip up the baby face would have fucking walked out now they're doing it on purpose but no i i, I knew what it was going to be and that's what it is and that's what it it'll well, it won't be that way anymore because Felix is about to drop it back because he was never supposed to have it to begin with in, on our Tuesday night TV fight episode. Then they had the MJF, uh, well, not MJF, but the Adam Cole package with Roddy and about the MJF situation, but Roddy and Taven and Bennett calling Adam Cole to Roddy's house, whatever the fuck, and they... They didn't play the audio. They There was the faint audio bleeding from the arena microphone or sound, but you couldn't tell what anybody was saying. And the, and it was it was long, and nobody bothered to stop it or do anything about it. And honestly, as I noted from the looks of the video of the video, it was a gift from the wrestling gods that we couldn't hear what they were saying. Because I figured, and rightfully so, as I'll get to in a minute, it was going to completely bury all the talent involved as being preliminary fucking jack-offs. So, that was that. And, and I, 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 would you like to comment on anything you didn't hear? I'll comment on it because I didn't watch the segment when it came back because I saw enough that I couldn't hear it and know that I didn't want to see any more of it. And I certainly didn't want to see it a second time. That was my chance to go check out what was going on in the Phillies game. But it's this Nickelodeon brand of humor. <sighs> to me, the biggest heel in AEW is whoever is working with MJF and Adam Cole and all these guys on these little comedy videos. And shooting those videos. Whoever's shooting them because there's a certain style to them that's really over the top, making the bad on top of the actual acting i like that roddy strong was getting a character now he's become a nickelodeon show character yeah adam it's cole, just childish i don't take adam cole seriously as an adult i'm sorry i don't and i hate all this stuff at you least can't, he's done it to himself and again i thought i got out of it because i said okay i don't have to watch these grown adults i think they're all maybe adam cole's a little younger but they're all like in their mid to late 30s i would think I have to go watch them act like they're teenagers. Not even teenage. I didn't act like that as a teenager. I don't know anyone who did. It's stupidity. Why does it's wrestling need bad comedy? None of these guys can do comedy. They all want to do comedy. Well, we can't even call this bad comedy because it's not. It's just, it's bad acting. It's bad overacting. It's ridiculously phony and, and trivializing talent that can perform and making an, the entire television program from start to finish look like a goddamn shit show. It, 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 and there's no reason for it. And these people are involved with the world champion, MJF. Or at least they have been. Hopefully they won't be anymore. 
because it'll just further fucking bury him and he's not needing any help these days. Even with the audio issues, as soon as you hear Roddy Strong yell at him, the way he's yelling his name, it's not getting the right kind of heat. It's getting the, whoa, stop doing this already. Yeah, that because kind of- if, if, if for you to feel any sympathy for Adam in the situation he's being put in, it would have to be believable enough that Adam could be somehow convinced by it, and this is just completely hokey bullshit that they're all just jacking off together on. There's no way around seeing that. And there's no way we're not going to get more of it if Adam Cole can't wrestle for a while. This is all we're going to get. Well, if we get this for however long he's out, by the time he comes back, he might as well not bother. Because people will literally throw rotten tomatoes at him. To have to watch this for months? Should they anyway, should they sell Rotten Tomatoes at the merch stand? They'd make more money. Be a good business. So before they could do anything about this technical fuck-up, Wardlow is scheduled. They go back to the arena. He, It's Wardlow versus Griff Garrison, and he power-bombed Griff five times, and the referee stopped it. And Gr- Griff, the last we saw, was a baby face. Does that mean Wardlow's a heel, or does that just mean Tony's booking is nonsensical and he pulverized an innocent young baby face who hadn't done anything to him? Is Wardlow back for real, or is he just going to come back and power bomb some more people and leave again? And why, for no apparent reason, did Wardlow, <laughs> after power bombing the guy into a pile of jelly and the referee stopping it Wardlow didn't even raise his hand to get a beauty shot he steps out of the ring and walks out through the crowd why did any of this take place? what is going on here it'll be a gimmick you know like oh I walked out of the building I don't know what's going on his hair looked very pretty I'll say that nice hair it was nice to see him on the show I mean the problem is whenever you see him you just think about how he's been misused at least he wasn't with Arn because that wasn't working at all We'll see. I mean, is this going to be the thing? Quick squash matches, which they've tried with him before. And then he walks out through the crowd to exactly where he can go. By the way, he walked in the direction of the ramp. So he's just walking in the crowd back yeah. where he can go. The he simple went through direct the crowd route. to go back down beside the ramp to go back where he came from to begin with. He just took the, he went around his elbow to get to his wrist. Unless it's supposed to be like some kind of Ernie Ladd thing. Like, okay, I wrestled, now everyone saw me and I'm walking out. But they No, didn't even Ernie did it that. before he before wrestled. Before he wrestled, If he was course. walking out over a payoff. I'm trying to say if that's what it was based on, but even I, that wouldn't make sense because no one referenced that. So it just, he's a badass, so he walks through the crowd. That's the badass. So, yeah. and, and it, but at least, at least he's a grown adult man. So he looks good. It's just the booking. Somebody on Twitter, I don't know if you saw this, I responded to it, said, well, the reason why, Jim, that the newer wrestlers don't look like grizzled old men is because they are clean living now and they don't drink and smoke and carry on debauchery or however it was worded right when i've said why are all these fucking wrestlers so unintimidating and so small and so they look 12 and that was the guy well they they just clean living now and i said how does any of that the drinking or the smoking or the carousing or the debauchery or whatever how does that make them five foot seven and 175 pounds and wearing a hairdo that looks like it was cut by Tinker Bell's younger sister? And then somebody rightfully responded to that saying, Yeah, I thought that uh, the drinking and smoking was supposed to stunt your growth, not accelerate it. So it basically, it's just a per- bunch of personalityless nitwits and all the real men have quit watching wrestling because it's fucking silly. Anyway, speaking of silliness, people with weird haircuts and injuries, Renee Moxley Good was in the back with Don Fallis and Take a Shit, and Sammy Guevara now is hurt. And one would have to think he's really hurt because... He wasn't even there. He didn't do a run-in. He wasn't even there? He wasn't even there. 
they just said on the recommendation of Will Ostrich, like, boy, that I'll take his word like Terry Funks. They picked Kyle Fletcher to be the partner of Take a Shit against Kenny and uh, Jericho. And when he said that, they were playing the, the interview to the audience and you could hear a small groan from the audience. Kyle Fletcher is the the young juvenile delinquent half of Ozzy Oldham with the weird haircut and the video game fucking pleather robe. He's got kind of a high-pitched voice. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy! Yeah. So now that's our, our big tag match. And then they come back to the announcers who apologize for the audio issue on TBS's part. They had to get that in. And they play this fucking thing again. And now the premise is Adam Cole is visiting Roddy's house, but he's on crutches. He's saying throughout the piece, literally, he's got to go get surgery. Like he's on his way to go get surgery on his, <laughs> his ankle, but he stopped by Roddy's house because Roddy asked for him. And Roddy is in a wheelchair and a neck brace and a hospital gown. And there's Taven and Bennett there. So they've taken four of my formerly favorite talents and Adam did it to himself first, but now I don't, I don't want to see Roddy anymore. I don't want to see Taven and Bennett. They'll never be taken seriously as top main event guys. So why am I, I don't even care now. And I'm, I'm ashamed and embarrassed of them like they should be for taking part in this thing. So fuck them all basically. But anyway, they got it. Roddy got Adam Cole one of those wheelie bikes so that he could prop his bad leg up in. And then they had slow mo shots with cheesy music of them rolling around the house together. And then Roddy tells Adam, But I brought you over here because I need you to help me move some furniture. Even though Taven and Bennett are able-bodied they can't do it because they don't have any taste so they did more slow-mo shots with cole making ridiculous faces accompanied by really bad music of him straining to lift the furniture while he has one leg and this is it's the furthest thing from any good I wrote disgusting, actually. And, and then he said, okay, I got to go get surgery now. And is he leaving? Oh, Adam. And uh, if this even, I would have been, if I was one of those guys standing there in the middle of that, I would have had the a presence of mind, the self-awareness to realize that this was not only the shits, and something that nobody would ever want to see, but it was ruining my wrestling career and making people not want to watch the fucking wrestling business anymore. That's how bad this was. And they should be ashamed of themselves. And I, I and again, it is wasting talent. Roddy ain't going to be the AEW champion, but he's a hell of a worker. And Taven and Bennett could have been a quality heel team that didn't look like goddamn Kyle fucking Fletcher and Mark fucking McGee or whatever his name is. Davis? And these indie fucking darlings that don't have a goddamn clue what they're doing. There's a new Taven and Bennett shirt that I saw that someone put in a Cult of Cornet Facebook group that AEW is selling. It says, punch him in the wiener, hit him with a pile driver. Oh, good God. And someone's supposed to buy that and wear that somewhere. This is all so bad. Like I said, the real enemy is the guy filming and editing this and directing it. That's the enemy here. Because it's someone who wants to do something else, but they're applying that to wrestling, and it's producing awful TV. But the people involved, the people involved, Roderick Strong has been around the business for a while. Adam Cole's been around the business for a while. They were in Ring of Honor when we tried to do shit right. They know the difference between right and wrong. Taven and Bennett. They've got talent. 
But nobody cares anymore about any of it now. Somebody should have said, you know, whoa, take me out of this fucking thing. What are we doing here? It's fucking ridiculous that they would go along with this. And everybody else just does what they want. That's the problem. They're so fucked up by the fucking goddamn insanity that has gripped this company that they think this is good and they want to do it. They've all given up on ever going to the WWE because this shit will fight this shit. This bad will follow you. People will be clipping shit like this on the internet for years, making fun of these motherfuckers. Well, I think that may be part of it. Um, I think first of all, these people all like what they're doing. So you can talk about their sensibilities when it comes to wrestling or even comedy or whatever it may be. But Roddy's been in WWE. Adam was in WWE. I think they're not looking at going back. I think they're looking at like, this is the end road I'm for I'm talking to Taven and Bennett. At one point, they, especially Taven, looked great when he had hair and was a young man. But, I... but he's not, to my point, they're not young men anymore. This is after a lifetime of But working... here's the thing. If you can do something well, and somebody pays you a lot of money but says, do what you do well, but do it shitty on purpose, make fun of your talent, make fun of your business, shit all over it, and do a rotten job. Can you really bring yourself to, why? Why? I, I think the problem is some people may not recognize how bad, bad shit is because they're a part of it. Well, anyway. Acclaimed and Billy Gunn beat the Butcher and the Baker and Pip Sabian. So they're still around, leeching, stealing from AEW. Tony Storm portrait of a star with RJ City. Your boy RJ City. You find him entertaining. I found him on his interview show. I found him entertaining on the interview show. I find Tony Storm entertaining. She's great. This gimmick is great. The Sunset Boulevard, we had faces then. I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille, the, you know, silent movie treatment. I, okay, all of that stuff, but here's the problem. On a wrestling show, this video and this gimmick would stand out. But on a do-it-yourself cable access sketch comedy show like this, it's just more silliness. And it on the same theory that if you have 12 seven-footers, you have no giants, everything is fucking silly and over the top, and people are auditioning for something in a business that they're not currently in. And it, and it blended. I want to like Tony Storm, and in the ring, she's great, and the, she's performing this well, but they're, instead of, instead of accenting the whether you call a heel crazy or eccentric or demented or deluded or whatever, instead of accenting that or accentuating it by everybody around them still being normal, when you put people in with them that are goddamn just as fucking weird and they're surrounded by activity that's just as fucking weird, it hampers that thing to get over. So it, I'm 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 struggling to like the stuff I like because it's just endless with this program. What do you think? I don't I don't know. You know, I told you when she first started doing these solo promos. Wow, there's something there. This is like the best stuff she's done. And then she kept going and going, and it's gotten further and further along. Now she's smearing the makeup on her face, and I'm sure it'll be like that every time. It's gone too far for me. Yeah. I recognize that she's talented. Like, really talented. Like, I think she actually shows more acting skills than most people in wrestling. And she should take those skills and get an agent and try to do something, because she's good. But it's becoming too much of the talent show again. Not again. It always has been, but I guess they're branching out from just talent in the ring to anything you want to film anywhere. 
Okay, 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 remember when Goldust started, it was a revolutionary gimmick, and he became a top guy, and, you know, you understood the gimmick. It's him, and it's Marlena, and the, he looks like an Oscar in the whole nine yards, but then, because he kept trying to make it fresh, and he had shit stain there to fucking spur him along, it got so ridiculous at the end, wearing the ball gags and the fucking lingerie, and he was talking about getting breast implants. That took two or three years. This has happened to Tony Storm in eight weeks. She went past, boy, this is really good, and into, like you said, this is too far. It's too much. And they're having yeah. too many skits. It's almost becoming Tuesday Night Titans yes. on Dynamite. It's just not skits even in the arena, just pre-taped skits. Well, we go back to the arena. Because in the ring was Juice Robinson and the Gun Boys. And they're talking about MJF. Of course, the thing's been going on with MJF and Jay White. And the guns are good. Not only do they work their ass off in the ring and they're animated heels and they've got some personality, but they can talk. It's not their fault that, that this whole thing is... Again, It's not the, they're not the bookers. And then Juice talked, and he's great, and he called out MJF. And MJF came out and responded from the owl way. And he called Juice a talentless taint, while Juice claimed that his taint was always rock hard. But then MJF, he did the deal The Rock did, where he, he's calling on his people in the arena to do a dueling chant. Except instead of whatever that Rock got bleeped, I can't remember, but it was ass boys and talentless taint. But I don't know if I would have done that two weeks after the biggest star in fucking wrestling came back to television on the highest rated wrestling program of the past several months at least and did the same goddamn thing in front of four times as many people. Did, was that the problem you had with this? There were a variety of problems I had with this. I mean, Juice Robinson came off, I think, better than everyone in this. Yeah. And the guns came off well, too. I think MJF <sighs> being a babyface works, but there are things being done that I don't think are good ideas right now. And we've sat back, and some of the things have worked with the crowd, like the kangaroo kick. And some of them have gotten into the things from some of these skits, even though these skits have gotten... The one last week with The Big Show was awful. Yeah. Like, this has gotten out of control with these bad skits on the show. But I think MJF is... You know, I don't want to say he's lost need, his way a little right now, needs but... Needs a course correction. There needs to be something different done. And again, this is a guy who every single time they seem to be setting him up for something, something goes awry. And yeah. fucks up all the plans. I have to think that has to affect you after a while. Like, I mean, Adam Cole just broke his foot jumping off the ramp. <laughs> Is Adam Cole ever going to be able to wrestle again? Is he, you know, I don't know. I don't want to say brittle, but I mean, can he wrestle? I don't know. So we'll see what happens. But the problem is, this is one of the first segments maybe in AEW history where MJF wasn't the cool one. Yeah. And he really wasn't the cool one here. Because it's obvious he's doing this on purpose. He was natural as a heel. It flowed off his tongue. The wit was biting. He was doing... You could listen to him all day. But this is not as deep or as wide. It's so wide you can't get around it. So high you can't get over. This ain't it. And I wrote at the time I was listening to this long drawn out bit of business i said i'm afraid babyface mjf saddled with bad creative and constantly being affected by injuries and talent issues has a shelf life and it's rapidly getting old well the thing is too and i apologize for swami in the background if you hear that but the thing is too never apologize for our good boys and girls the fans wanted mjf to be their scumbag they didn't want the scumbag to become nice. 
or not necessarily nice, but just not have that edge anymore. Yes. They want the scumbag. They want to cheer. If Steve Austin had become a baby face when he became a baby face, it would have killed him. Yeah. Well, and I'm going to bring something else up here in a second. Let's, let's get to the meat of this matter because MJF then challenges him to a Stockton street fight and he's going to get in the ring a three on one. But all three of the heels bail out when he gets in and suddenly Jay White from behind grabs MJF and hits his finish. A kind of an inverted crossroads. Okay, it's a nice move, right? And lays him out and takes his belt. And then will not leave well enough alone and goes back to the entranceway and does another uninteresting promo of his. He's got many uninteresting promos in his quiver, and he did another one. And he looks like any other indie wrestler ever. And he's got a whiny voice without conviction in it. And it went along. While MJF had to lay there in the ring and do nothing, selling one move. The motherfuckers on this program don't sell cannonballs. But the world champion gets hit with one move and stays down while they stand over him, they steal his belt, and then they trash talk him from the entranceway. And what you're going to say, Brian... Well, and, and then also as trash talking him, they challenge him for a match at the pay-per-view on November 18th, the next pay-per-view. And you're going to say, well, there's no way this could be any worse. Yes, it could. I wrote, oh my God, MJF is getting up and answering. The world champion, our scumbag, the dirtiest player in the game, has just been attacked from behind, laid out, his belt stolen, the people who did it are still in the entranceway, and he gets up, gets a microphone, and accepts their challenge. What the fuck? If anything, Jay White should have left with the belt, never spoken, and after a break, MJF be demanding a fucking match. I'm going to take my belt back, I'm going to kick your ass too. Not the other way around. This was ridiculous. And here's the goddamn thing. If you've got a baby face who is over as a baby face only because he was such a great heel and the fans wanted to see that scummy heel shit done to the other heels they don't like, but he then consistently gets out healed, it buries him. He's still supposed to be the one that's jumping from behind or that's getting some kind of underhanded advantage on the heels because they deserve it. Not every time. You can get heat on him. But on little things, he needs to do little things to outheal other people, outsmart other people, be a back jumper to other people. And then finally, they have more guys, they do a numbers advantage, then, then they get the heat. But you can't just treat him like a babyface. If he hadn't been such a heel, he would not be over this way now that they've switched him babyface. He just wouldn't. So you can't take all that away from him. Lawler found that out in, in, from 1977 to 79. By, by the time 79 came, he had to constantly do promos saying the old king is coming back this week because that's what the people wanted to see. So he finally had to switch back heel to try to restore that with the thought being he would switch babyface again at whatever point, but he broke his leg. So that artificially created a demand for him to come back as a babyface, and he did and he didn't switch heel again for another five fucking years. But this ain't that. And they're they're killing off the golden goose presenting MJF in this fashion. I'm done. So then we had Jericho and Twinkle Toes against Take a Shit and Kyle Fletcher. Takeshta. With Don Fallis on color. Don Fallis. And I wrote no fucking way. 
Guess which pony they beat? Fletcher. One of these things is not like the other. Tell me about the match I missed before we talk about the afterbirth. It was nothing I guess you would want to watch, so nothing you would enjoy. I think Omega's looking really rough in there. I mean, he still could do a lot of stuff, but watching him move around physically, it looks like he's in a lot of pain. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it looks like. Well, I'm in a lot of pain watching him move around, so... I love Takeshita. He's got size, he's got presence in there, he delivers his stuff. That's all I gotta say about and, the match. And, he, and he, he looks like a star, and he's gonna be buried in all of this blah. But anyway, um, as soon as the babyfaces had won, guess who hit the ring? Powerhouse Hobbs and beat the shit out of Jericho and Harpo. And I'm, th I'm thinking, well, this is great. He's away from QT. He's, uh, he's involved in mostly main event people. It wasn't, uh, Fletcher was not supposed to be involved in this. At least they're doing something with him, right? But then, because they cannot, they cannot make a point. They cannot do something and be done with it. It has to be a goddamn major motion picture production that kills the whole fucking thing. They threw Twinkle Toes over the railing into the empty section of ringside that's sitting there at every fucking TV taping. Did you notice that? Somehow, there were four rows of about four or five chairs across, totally empty, that Omega could land in. Well, if you see the side opposite the camera, it's not surprising there'd be empty seats. Well, but no, this is from the front row on back. They actually cleared out a section of seats of the in plain view of the people so that somehow Kenny could be deposited there totally by chance moments later. And then it was already going too long. Hobbs should have come in, kicked the shit out of both of them, sidelined Jericho like they did, and then done some damage to Harpo or held him for Callus to do it, whatever their point was, and then got out of there. And they would have made a strong point and an, and an impact and an impression. You're saying it already went too long by the time he threw him over the barricade, right? It's already, they, yeah, they're out of the ring. What are they doing? They're wandering around at a snail's pace out on the floor now with this thing, and nobody's coming to help. And the announcers are saying that, well, Maddie Jackson went with Nikki Jackson to the hospital after his match, and Hangnail Page isn't here, so Kenny's all alone. Except for the 80 other wrestlers on the roster and about 10 referees and a bunch of security guys and some doctors, he was completely by himself. No, they're not even ringing the bell. Four heels have just decided that they're going to trash the most important people in the company, but there's no urgency. There's no danger. There's no nobody trying to stop it. So then they're out there. And what explain to me what Hobbs was doing with the bicycle rack guardrail? He stuck Kenny's head in between the spokes of the guardrail and then took it off of him again. And again, if you looked at the guardrail, to me, the first thing I noticed when he went for it, I'm like, well, it's weird. There's one spot there where it's like there's an extra space. Oh, no, he pulled he pulled one of the uh, spokes out. Oh, it did, I didn't even see that, but yeah, I noticed he, the extra space. I'm like, okay, that's where he's going to put his head. He pulled one of the spokes out and had a metal rod in his hand and a, an opponent at his feet, and instead of just beating him with the <laughs> metal rod, he threw the rod down and stuck the guy's head in the rail. And then Kenny held it there to his throat because yes. Hobbs was ready to move on. Yes, and then he took it off, and then they went back to the ring. And where Jared, they're, now they're trying to duct tape Kenny to the rope spread out like he's on the cross, but they couldn't work the duct tape. Eventually, they got it, I guess, good enough, but it was still, it was loose on one side, and the, the roll was still attached on the other side. And then Don Fallis insists on taking the chair and hitting Kenny over the head with it. And it was a stiff shot, but it wasn't dangerous. And I saw on the internet, everybody, oh my God, an unprotected chair shot. How dare they? And that fucking little goddamn pansy-ass fucking sock-faced piece of shit on commentary 
I'm fed up with that motherfucker, too. He's got, well, this is an era of wrestling that we thought and hoped was over. Yeah, because you're a soft little pussy, you fucking gutless prick. Point yeah. is. Yeah. Point is. And Shivani sucks, too. Yeah. Everybody was upset. He hit him in the head one time with a stiff and not dangerous shot with a chair. It wasn't ECW-like, and that's why they had Don do it. They weren't going to have Hobbs do it. And if this had been a good angle, it would have been worth it. That's what they should have done. Hobbs should have hit the ring, spine-bustered the motherfucker, taped him to the ropes, and let Don hit him with a chair. And then Don hold Hobbs' hand up in the air. But instead, we got this goddamn outlaw, indie-rific bunch of bullshit. So if it had been a good angle, the chair shot was worth it. Since this whole thing stunk the joint out, it was the shits anyway. And it but I'm glad that Hobbs is away from QT. And it went forever. And when they were on the uh, other side of the barricade where the fans are, you know, the fans just stood there and watched. <laughs> you know, no one was really yeah. upset about it. They were just, oh, this is what's happening now. They couldn't get the duct tape to work. Even the commentators had to say, he's trying to get Callis' attention and duct tape won't stay. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was so it just, bad. It won't stick. It won't stick. This episode was just filled with bad ideas that people convinced themselves were good ideas. We'll see about Hobbs with uh, Callis. Hobbs and Takeshita together is very interesting and a stable. But, you know, Callis kind of sucks. But we'll see what happens. Uh, grading on a curve, if we could get uh, it, it, Don Fallis together with Take a Shit and Powerhouse Hobbs and keep out the miscellaneous foreigners that keep bopping in and out because they don't live here and there's there's no continuity to them. Aussie, you Aussie, might, Aussie! Yeah. You might be able to concentrate and and get a couple of these heels over. But nevertheless, you know, at this point in the show, and we were not over yet. I was thinking, how and what type... Some never got of, over. What type of steps can I take to try to understand what's going on here? Because it's inexplicable to the ordinary mind. And I thought, maybe, do I need more sleep? Do I need to be able to focus and concentrate on this better to try to figure out this conundrum, this puzzle, this riddle that is being placed in front of me, make sense out of this program? And then I realized... Yes, CBD. Because if the people presenting you something are on THC, you need to be on the CBD to counter it. And folks, our friends at CB Distillery can lead you down the right path of that because they have not only a full range of carefully formulated CBD and other plant-based solutions to your problems, but it's 100% clean ingredients, no artificial flavors, no colors, no preservatives, no cow pies, no manure, no mud, no rat droppings, clean ingredients. Because after all, 90% of the customers report better sleep with CBD. 81% say CBD helps with stress and anxiety. 80% report less pain after physical activity. And 2.1% report changing their identity and moving to Guatemala. No. Nope. And you can do these type of things, too. Except that, which is not something that people voted for on the survey. Well, but you're entirely entitled to do it if you want to. Well, and you can take your CBD yeah. products along with you. Well, yeah, I guess technically that part is true, yes. Well, yes, yeah, so you got two million satisfied customers. Not all of them are living in Guatemala, but all of them can tell you that CBD has helped them with their focus and concentration and figuring out these these incredible problems it's like a gordian knot of bad booking just take a bunch of cbd and you'll be as smart as tony khan well that might not be a selling point yeah i don't know if i would use that how about this if you're frustrated with a health concern that's not getting any better or a pro wrestling show you're watching that's getting worse then try cbd how about that that works okay well then in that case you need to save some money folks tell you what i'm gonna do just because I like you, I'm going to get you 20% off. You know, Mama Cornette used to say, just because I like you, I'm going to give you 20% off. You got to go to cbdistillery.com right now and enter my code, 
JCE for that 20% discount, cbdistillery.com, promo code JCE, 20% off everything on the site, and there's no prescription required. You don't even have to forge anything or find somebody in your immediate family that has handwriting that looks like a physician's. You can just order with impunity. cbdistillery.com, promo code JCE, 20% off. And I'm telling you, you're going you're gonna to love this stuff because it's going to, you'll be able to hear colors. You'll be able to, to see no. musical notes floating in the air, and you'll be able to understand AEW wrestling. None of that is guaranteed, and uh, none of that is really likely. However, you will get a good night's sleep if that is what you need. Help from some of the sores and aches and sores? various other things. Well, not sores. Aches and pains. But I don't want to go as far as pain. Aches and achy areas. Whatever it may be, let's focus on a good night's sleep. CB Distillery, what's the promo code, Jim? That's JCE, but if you've got open sores, you might better go elsewhere. All righty, then. We're back to AEW. Aussie Open Sores. Oh, very good. I'm a little sore about Aussie Open. So Renee Moxley Good was in the back with MJF in the trainer's office, where he is getting looked at because of the vicious finishing move that he took from Jay White, right? And I, I remind you, this is the world champion. And the heel has just dropped the champion on his head, stolen the world title belt, and challenged him for a world title match at the pay-per-view, which the babyface beltless champion now has accepted. And he's in the trainer's office, and he's starting to talk about that when there's the acclaimed just in the background, and Caster sneaks up behind MJF and takes the place of the trainer that's given MJF the neck rub and starts rubbing MJF's neck, and MJF looks up and sees him and jumps up and stops selling and just accuses Caster, who's another babyface, of being a stalker and leaving him weird emails and tweets. And Renee Moxley Good even says, yeah, I've seen some of those tweets. They're disturbing. And then... MJF says, I, I've got to call Adam Cole. Of course you would, after some other strange man has come up and rubbed your neck. and Who apparently has been stalking you. Who apparently has been stalking, and Caster's not the gay one, right? Well, straight men can stalk other straight men. There's nothing. Why is he rubbing his neck? I was about to say, there's nothing on? wrong with that. There's plenty wrong with that, but you could stalk whoever you want to stalk, and I would there's assume. Baby fa Are you saying that you know heterosexual stalking is acceptable? I'm saying no stalking is... I think we should get rid of all stalkers. <sighs> Nevertheless, he calls Adam Cole on the phone and gets Adam's voicemail. And, like, that's the a, the worst thing that could ever happen. And, and Renee goes, oh, my God. And MJF is... Anybody that calls me gets my voicemail because I don't sit by the fucking phone all the time waiting for people to call and bother me. But the point... I wrote, this is the worst TV show ever. The world champion is now being stalked by another baby face in a weird fashion that we don't understand. And, and that's taking the TV time away from the main event world title match to the next pay-per-view. What the fuck is going on here? I don't know. Apparently, I asked uh, someone who watches AEW, or at least pays attention to the Twitter workings of AEW a little more than I do. They said that, I guess because Caster and MJF both come from that Creative Pro school, they have a long-standing relationship, possibly, and maybe they've been teasing each other on social media for a few years at least. That Caster has an obsession with MJF. I assume that's what they why were alluding to here. here. Why did this? Why did this emerge on television at this particular moment at this time, right when they're supposed to be selling the main event of a pay-per-view? I fear we're going to get like a three-way war between MJF, the acclaimed, and Billy Gunn <sighs> against Bullet Club Gold against Roddy and Taven and Bennett and whoever that fourth person is. Because we still don't know who the mystery person is who beat up Jay White, who was pretending they were MJF wearing his devil mask. 
Good God. If that's not MJF, you have to think it's one of these other suspects. <laughs> what are you, the sea hag? I'm, what is this? I'm trying to clear my sinuses. That's this how you, shit's clogging my head up. That's how you clear your sinuses? <laughs> it's like a fire so anyway, alarm. they did a personality piece on Samoa Joe. Remember we were talking about it on the drive-thru, how you can do a personality piece like Magnum TA riding the motorcycle through the streets of Atlanta or the Rock and Roll Express out grabbing girls on the ass next to the fucking jukebox or whatever the case, but that it was kind of out of place for Adam Edge Copeland to bother before he's saving his friend from a ass kicking to drive through the streets of the fucking town in a goddamn muscle car on a video on the screen, right? Didn't exactly impart a sense of urgency. Maybe a good clip, not the timing. This was a good one. They, they, even the blind guy whacks the pinata every once in a while, right? They, he's sitting there dressed up. He's got the whiskey and the cigar. He's talking like an adult man. He looks like a badass. They've got highlights of him, you know, in MJF doing their thing, you know, over the top of it. He's a, a good promo. And he's maybe the thing with MJF isn't over because he's still talking about MJF. You got my respect, but I'll be back. And he went, the, the line he went home with, he'd been talking about champions and people who want to be champions need to be hungry and he knows what hunger is like and then he ended up saying whenever i'm hungry i always manage to be fed and how did the wwe drop the ball on him i'm trying to figure out because he's the best heel in the fucking company well when you say those words in wwe you know whenever i get hungry i need to be fed they say go on a diet but no, Samoa Joe is the only, he's the only heel in this company, isn't he? That's really, can talk, it can talk and work and carries it off and is never funny or silly or stupid. I do think sometimes he's a little too, it's a little too performy at times, certain words or mannerisms, but overall I agree with you. But what about Christian Cage? Okay, I'm sorry, I forgot about Christian. So, so... Christian Cage and Samoa Joe are the top two heels in the company because they're the only ones that actually act like it. And Don Callis, he's another one of the top heels because technically he is well, a bigger heel than anyone in his stable, right? It, well, he he's acting like it. God damn, it's still, he's trying to do the old manager shit, but he he doesn't know when to do it because he didn't live. He came right after that era. He was a fan during that era. Did you notice when they're beating the shit out of? Uh, Kenny, after they'd hit, he'd hit him with the chair and everything, he goes back over and kicks him and then sells like he hurt his foot kicking Kenny in his fucking chest. There's not even any bone there. You, what, you, the heel manager sells his foot when the team has lost or the, his guy has lost and he's pitching a fit in the middle of the ring after the baby face has already gone to what we used to call get your heat back. Make the people forget about you losing because the manager kicks the turnbuckle in frustration and then hops and hurts his foot. I've done that. Everybody's done that. Different context, different timing. When you're doing a serious heat angle where you've just hit a guy over the head with a fucking chair, you don't then show the fans that you hurt your foot by kicking the baby face because that makes the fans want to laugh at you and that's not the response you're going for. They're all doing shit they've seen on fucking television. But even guys who've been around the business for 25 years don't know how to fucking apply it. You did, ah! a, you did it great at the Night of Legends after you guys lost the match to the Thrill Seekers. The Heavenly Bodies lost to the Thrill Seekers. Yeah. You kicked the corner a bunch of times real fast. You were obviously mad. And then you turned around and you immediately can't take a step. Yeah, and then You're I was like, oh shit, what have I done? Yeah. And that, because again, that's why Dusty had me take the bump off the scaffold, because the Road Warriors have to win, the Midnight Express got beat, but he didn't want the people to remember the Midnight Express got beat, he wanted the people to remember that the Road Warriors won and Cornette took the bump. And that's what everybody remembers, because that's the way it works. And then you help save the guys that did the job for you by giving them a little 
a little out and putting the attention elsewhere, getting the heat back, whatever. Well, we'll see what happens with Samoa Joe. Sky Blue wrestled Tony Storm. And Tony Storm has the black and white film treatment uh, on the entrance like Goldust did. I think she should be announced from Sunset Boulevard, don't you? I mean, that's part of the problem. It's one thing, like, if you lose your mind and you, you know, become a different person or have a personality issue. Yeah, it's one thing if you just lose your mind. It's another thing if all of a sudden you think you're an actress in the 40s. In Hollywood, like, what the, f like, where did this come from? Like, it's one thing to start, like, slowly losing your mind. You're a heel, you know, you're having issues. But now we're, all, I mean, the black and white intro, the makeup. Like I said, sh she has something going on. It went too far for me. This is a year of character exposition that we've seen in a month and a half. My fear is this becomes her broken Matt Hardy in something that yeah. some fans are like, oh, wow, it's so funny and great. And other fans are like, this is everything I hate about television. Well, and but the thing is, there's no producers, there's no directors, there's no authority, there's no, there's nobody to say, no, this is too far, you're ruining a good thing, you put too much salt in the fucking stew, whatever the case. To tone it back, you want to take this direction. Don't just let everybody figure out their own shit and show it on national TV while they're doing it. There has to be some structure and there is none. And then finally, we get to the last segment that we talked about a little earlier because of all the other technical difficulties. I guess, eh, eh, to be honest, they could have, with, with knowing, because they had to know by that point in time that their DVR listing was screwed up in many places. And they knew that the interview had been screwed up and they had to play it again. If they knew that they didn't have time to get this, the major angle, the thing that the, the focal point of the TV show in, in the allotted time, why not scratch the girls match till next week and just get edge in the fucking ring. Hey, listen, why not scrap that match? Or why not cut down on the Omega beating? Why did that go for 10 minutes? Well, because they think they that knew that, by that point about the time issue. You would. Yeah. Think. They, they think that that makes it good though. Cause that's, where they're at headwise they thought that they thought that what they did that ruined the whole thing actually made it better which is part of the problem here but nevertheless tony shivani's in the ring he calls out edge entrance takes the microphone puts tony over and then kicks him out of the fucking ring and i've said but edge can talk and you have you've said the same thing about him you said about cody sometimes that it's too theatrical. It's too much of a an acting performance. It's always the same thing. It's the guy who wanted to be an actor, took acting classes, needs sounding boards to try out his promos before he does them. There's an unnaturalness that comes with that. You have to be really good to get past that. And at times, Edge, to me, didn't. But I think he did here. And I agree with you. Okay, well, good. At least we're not going to fight. I agree. I thought this was really good. He explained why he came, and, and we've heard it. The media scrum, the fresh matchups, different opponents, and et cetera. And he was very well-spoken, and the people are glad to see him. And then he calls out Christian Cage right at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and here comes Christian. And thankfully, I saw it live, and I took no notes. But what was impressed upon me is that edge made a really good pitch a heartfelt pitch he said whatever's been going on whatever you've been involved in let's let's do that let's end our careers together let's get back to let's do it one more time to show everybody that we were the best tag team and let's forget you know forget about whatever's happened before and let's get back together what do you say pal type of thing and there's the the milk and the weight, and then Christian holds his hands out, and they give the big hug. And the people are like, yay! And Christian still has his microphone in his hand. And as they're hugging, he leans over Edge's shoulder, and of course they bleeped it, as they should have. But you got the idea. He told Edge, 
Go fuck yourself. And all the, the people, oh. And he turned around and walked out. And I'm interested because I don't want to see the fucking dinosaur. I don't want to see a lot of the people around the periphery of this thing, but edge against Christian will not only be good, but carry uh, some fucking weight with people. So they've got something there. And I hope to God we won't be seeing them do, doing silly, unfunny, not comedy bullshit videos and etc. I hope they'll do wrestling promos and have a wrestling match and it'll be enjoyable. You can't take anything for granted here, but they set themselves up for if this could draw some money if they don't fuck it up. But there and the problem is they had to, they not a lot of people saw it. So they had to announce that it's up on, I guess, the website, on the TBS site, the... Right, it's done really well on YouTube. I know the two Edge appearances so far have... I mean, I think they both have done over 2 million views so far. Probably well past it. I have to check the actual number. Well, then more people saw it than would have saw it if it was on the TV properly. But because of word of mouth and because of all the hoo-ha about how a lot of people didn't see it first time around. But, I mean, this show, it's... This was the worst TV show from a standpoint of putting something together, formatting it, using the talent the proper way, just booking a thing to begin with, except for that, the Edge and Christian deal, that I may have ever seen them do. It was just abysmal. It's abysmal. Nothing's clicking. The wind is going crazy in the background. Nothing's really clicking right now other than maybe the Adam Copeland stuff. It's all fresh. Everything just seems to be missing something now. The crowds are not getting bigger in the States. There's that clip that went around of Edge, of Adam Copeland, running to the stage on both sides when he debuted. <laughs> did you see that one? Yes, I did. And he, he ran to the left, and the people cheered, and then he ran to the right, and you could see on his face he looked up, there's nobody on that side of the arena. And he ran in the ring, and he did it. Look, there's a chance with these two guys, this could be really, really good. Or it could be overthought and too much unnecessary stuff is thrown in there. Christian's typically been good since he became a heel, other than the over-reliance on, by the way, your parents are dead. Everyone you care about is dead. Like, he's done that yeah. too many times now. Yeah. It could be really good. You know, between these two guys working together and Jericho and Callis, it's like 90s Canadian independent wrestling unleashed on this fucking show. Except nobody is as young then now as they yeah. were then. Where's Brother Midnight? That's what we really need. <clears throat> now, this was a bad episode, and it continues a bad trend for AEW. And the commentary has never been worse. They are all insufferable. They've dragged Taz down. I can't even listen to Taz anymore. And Shivani yeah. is awful. And Excalibur is... I apologize to Michael Cole. Excalibur is much more unbearable than Michael Cole has ever been. Oh, Michael Cole is goddamn Walter Cronkite or Edward R. Murrow next to this. But I've, I've always gone after Michael Cole for mediocre work. And I'm not saying I like a lot of his stuff, but he's better than Excalibur. Excalibur's At least he sounds awful. professional. He's not only he sounds professional and he sounds like an intelligent adult human. That's two things a sock face can't get. You know, as the Bucks lose their popularity, as this version of fucking whatever you want to call it to wrestling, pro wrestling guerrillaism, the idea that these guys don't need any, to pay any attention to the past or anything anyone in the past has to say, just do whatever you want because you're chasing the pop you want. Hopefully a lot of these guys eventually go away, including Excalibur. He is so bad. Well, if they can ever extricate the buckaroos out of there, he'll be gone. And then Ian Riccoboni hosting one show, Kevin Kelly hosting the other show. Yeah, and you know what? With that said, I hope Caprice gets another shot on uh, one of the big shows, not on the internet at some point in the future, because he's been pretty good and impressive yeah. the last few times I've heard him, too. But anyway, speaking of who watched it, who didn't, before we close the chapter on the, the uh, low point in Dynamite TV history, Yes, and the apologists were already saying, well, it would have done a better number if it hadn't been all for the problems. The question is, of the people who 
did find the program through all of that, and having the biggest star they've signed in the past couple of years in the main event or in the last spot, did they keep the audience this week, whatever audience they were able to get? Well, this past week's show, AEW Dynamite on TBS, October 4th, 2023, on average, was watched by 800,000 viewers. Even? Even. Well, okay, that's down fifty to 75,000 from what they've been doing every week, and they had an uh, extra 100,000 for their Arthur Ashe episode a few weeks ago, but uh, obviously this had some effect. The question is, what effect did the continuing developing rottenness have from where they started to where they ended up with the biggest angle they've done in a while with the biggest star in actually quarter nine? Fuck. Jesus. Yeah, and a few notes here. These were compiled by WrestleNomics, and uh, this was the lowest total viewership since May 3rd for Dynamite. Also, for the record, there were uh, Major League Baseball wildcard games on ESPN and ESPN2 head-to-head with Dynamite. Wildcard, bitches! That's what I ended up watching, actually, and I went back to this after the fact because uh, I couldn't do it anymore. So competition and also whatever these DVR issues are. And there was the all-night gas station open down the road, and how can you compete with that? Hey, on Long Island, 24-hour bagels are the best. But quarter one, 8 to 8, 15 p.m., Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, and Adam Copeland's backstage run-in, and the beginning of Ray Phoenix versus Nick Jackson with picture-in-picture, 804,000 viewers. Okay, well, in that case, if they started there and they have that average, they had to go up. Was it a case of people finding the show that was miss? listed or whatever because they can't go much farther down or they wouldn't have that average well quarter two eight fifteen eight thirty p.m the continuation of ray phoenix versus nick jackson adam cole roddy strong in the kingdom's home video or video at home i guess and wardlow versus griff garrison with an ad break seven hundred and eighty eight thousand viewers okay so they lost sixteen thousand but they're still right in the pocket and again, that was the segment with the audio issues. Quarter 3, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. The Don Callis backstage angle, the replay with sound this time of the Cole Strong Kingdom video, and Billy Gunn and the Acclaimed versus The Butcher, The Baker, and Kip Sabian with picture in picture. Oh, and the Tony Storm video. 715,000 viewers. Jesus H. Christ. Okay. That they can't be lost... DVR related. No. They lost 73,000 people in a quarter, and they're going to have to go up or this this average doesn't work. So what's what's going on here? And again, that audio issue. No one wanted to see that video a second time, and then they played it. Quarter 4, 8.45 to 9 p.m. An ad break a Wrestle Dream recap and the beginning of the Juice Robinson and the Guns promo calling out MJF and the angle with Jay White. 796,000 viewers. <laughs> so the, the, that, that MJ or Adam Cole and Roddy video in that quarter three, just a bunch of people said, fuck it, we'll do anything else but watch this. So they're back up to within 8,000 of where they started from after losing 89,000 in 45 minutes. Quarter five, the big nine o'clock hour, the continuation of the Jay White MJF live promo and beatdown, Orange Cassidy and Hook's backstage angle, Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega versus Takeshita and Kyle Fletcher with picture in picture, 849,000 viewers. Good Lord, okay, a much bigger... A jump the normal 53,000 folks for the top of the nine o'clock hour, and it lit, they had their main event guys in there. But as we mentioned, that was kind of a long, burdensome thing to watch. So, where'd they go from there? Quarter six, 9 15 to 9 30 p.m., the continuation of the previous tag match, the post match beatdown from Powerhouse Halbs on Kenny Omega, 819,000 viewers. So back down 30,000. 
and they're starting to there it looks like they're going to they're going to finish about the same place they started after having a couple of peaks in a valley quarter 7 9:30 to 9:45 p.m. MJF in the training room being massaged by Max Caster the Samoa Joe video and the beginning of Tony Storm versus Sky Blue with picture in picture 795,000 viewers and they're back down around that 800,000 mark. That was 24,000 at Bit the Dust. Quarter eight, and once again, we do have an overrun here. Quarter eight, 9.45 to 10 p.m. The finish of Tony Storm versus Sky Blue. Stokely Hathaway's backstage promo. Oh, I forgot. He's on the board of directors of a Ring of Honor, apparently. Somehow a heel manager got on the board of directors. Go ahead. An ad break. And the beginning of Adam Copeland's live promo, 809,000 viewers. And I'll give you the overrun here. Well, hold on. I'm just, that's another uh, 14,000. But basically, uh, they, they, did, they didn't hold the audience. They lost a lot of the audience. Then they gained more of the audience. Then they lost that audience. And now they're finishing up about where they started from. And finally, eight minutes, an eight-minute overrun, 10 to 10.08 p.m. Adam Copeland's confrontation with Christian, 852,000 viewers. Okay, but now was that... The program wasn't even listed to be on. So wait, what exactly was the DVR problem? So it's not that your DVR recorded a different show in the time slot, it just recorded a different time slot for a different show? Yeah, it, it listed AEW as being on from 4 to 6 p.m., so it recorded whatever was on TBS from 4 to 6 p.m. And then Young Sheldon was listed four episodes from 8 to 10 p.m. So you wouldn't have got that. But for the people that tune in anyway and don't worry about DVR in it, the, the show was in the correct time period. But what I'm asking here is that how would suddenly 43,000 people switch over into that ninth quarter hour when edge was already in the ring he'd already called christian out was suddenly people it wasn't a case of i gotta turn over now that it's 10 o'clock to see what's on the last segment of aew it was supposed to be over so how did they get that was it tuning in for the next show or people just realized i i the, that's an odd pattern I can't remember. We've been covering these ratings for a couple of years. They've never done their show low in the third quarter. But they had a a major star in the ninth quarter. And that's where they usually do the, the lowest number of the Dynamite show is eighth quarter or the overrun. And they did the highest. So I don't know what the fuck's going on here. And either did they. That was AEW Dynamite. Oh, come on now! I was trying to find something, and it wasn't exactly there with this uh, no, sound. No, it certainly wasn't. You weren't finding it at all. You were beating all around that bush without ever hitting the nail on the hammer. I got it. Dick, it. Stop it. I got it Stop. before. Well, we, are, Jim, we are in the future. Yeah. I'm about to future endeavor you. You know, a, a million people listening to this podcast right now just thought that their goddamn device, whatever it may be that they're listening on, had goddamn been taken over by the Martians or was flummoxing on the Fritz and yeah, they're hearing the future of sound after rock and roll after rap. There's going to be this crap. Well, showing you the future. Fortunately, I won't live that long. But if do you think anybody's still listening now to the pro? Do do they did they persevere through that so that we can explain that we have indeed time traveled from where we were a few seconds ago? To where we are now so that we can update you on more of the wrestling that has happened this weekend including the fast lane pay-per-view uh, they named it fast lane and it had some of the slowest matches they've ever done 
But uh, we we would be remiss if we didn't close out our AEW section because collision happened again. And the only thing of note, as usually there's no notes, like what you just did there on the time travel. But the note was the tag team championship has changed hands. FTR was defeated, lost the tag team title to Ricky Starks and Big Bill. It turns out it wasn't what gun, it was, oh, that gun. <laughs> oh, we have no knowledge of that. No, that's true. But I be, somebody should have a potentially be staring down the barrel of a gun over this finish. And it, I, I, we like everybody involved, but explain to me, Brian, this is my point. Here just several weeks ago, the team of FTR and the team of Gin and Juice, Jay White and Juice Robinson, had the consensus pick by almost everybody for the greatest fucking tag team match of all time. And instead of making Jay and Juice the next tag team champions, the top heel tag team, after a performance like that, instead they put Jay White in the world title picture where he ain't going to draw 15 cents in Chinese money. And Ricky Starks, who is a budding single with a great, like a Shawn Michaels diesel combination with Big Bill, to focus upon him and have Big Bill be the fucking muscle and blah, blah, blah. They have now somehow become the tag team champions despite not being a tag team for more than the last four fucking weeks. How the fuck is he, what is he doing? I don't have a firm answer for that. And I don't think he does either. And the other thing is, you know, we've said it. And I apologize for any noise in the background. I never know what people can Oh, hear. here we go. Oh, again. it's happening. And you know, it's happening. It's happening. But speaking of happenings, we heard a lot about Wembley. And when a lot of things were happening, people were pointing to Wembley that it was coming up. And then it happened, and people were pointing back to Wembley that it happened. How many people were in Salt Lake City to see this title change last night as we are recording? I, I don't know. I, I saw something on Twitter where it looked like that maybe that was the, the fucking, I don't know, the, the Usher crew in the audience in an empty NBA-sized arena. There weren't many people there. They're booking to make themselves happy. They're not booking to draw fans. And it's happening everywhere. They're killing every market they return to. And markets they go to aren't as hot as they would be in the past. And the booking and the skits and the comedy, it's not helping. It's not what AEW fans want. And it's not what fans who keep trying to give AEW a chance want. Well, and by the way, this was not a match. Also, what, uh, they, the heels just jump-started it. And sideline cash, even though a, a senior citizen from Sapporo on the other program withstood everything but a goddamn nuclear submarine shoved up his ass before he was defeated, but cash was taken out, and then Dax was manhandled and posted and choke slammed by the giant and beaten. It was just, it would, <laughs> here we go. So it, it, what if Cash is hurt? And this is a way, you know, you've seen that in the past with Dynamite Kid when he got carried to the ring on Davy Boy's back, allegedly. There's no footage of it because he couldn't walk and he had to get the belts off them. Could that be what this is? Well, if that's the case, then I would excuse something like that. But since they've never been able to keep anybody else being hurt a fucking secret, wouldn't you think we would have hurt? Where would he have got hurt? Hiding his gun. Oh, come on. <laughs> Get off he's not as flexible as a skinny guy. He's a big guy. He's big. No, what I'm saying is what you would have, someone would have seen him be injured in such a fashion. One would think to have reported something, there'd have been some question, whatever. I'm certainly open to being corrected there, but holy shit. It wasn't even like the Road Warriors Midnight Express double turn where they rushed us at the start and hurt Bobby and then, Stan valiantly fought for a while and then couldn't take it and Bobby tagged in and got beat. It was just boom. Here you go, fuck you and boom, boom, boom and fuck you. 
So I, d I don't know what the fuck was going on there. But again, isn't Starks more valuable as a single when he was not too long ago rubbing noses with CM Punk? And, <laughs> and is Big Bill more valuable as just being his muscle? Yes. And does anybody think that Jay White is supposed to be a top singles guy when the team, with Juice doing maybe 60% of the talking, was excellent and could be a leading heel team that could lead other teams? I, 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 I don't know where they're fucking going here. Maybe FTR need time off. I don't know. But there was an interesting tweet last night. A lot of the listeners have sent over. Some people posted it on the Cult of Cornet Facebook group. Dax on Twitter, at DaxFTR, what a run. Love you all. Top guys out. <laughs> and there were four pictures there, one of FTR celebrating it all in, one of FTR in the ring with MJF and Adam Cole, one of, it looks like, Dax with Jay White, and one of CM Punk with FTR. So naturally, everyone saw that and jumped to all the conclusions anyone who saw that would think. So then he had to put out a second tweet. Guys, I say top guys out all the time. We ain't going nowhere. This is our home. So he uh, certainly well, found the, a good way to make no point. The first tweet, if it had been accompanied by Frank Sinatra's My Way with the, the audio over the top of that, would have been a wonderful farewell tweet if you were going away to a deserted island somewhere, wouldn't it? I can see why people may have, uh, and also immediately after they just got run over by a steamroller. And maybe after, at this point, they should take some time off because they've been there for five, what fucking four years and they still haven't figured out what to do with these poor fellows. And who do they have to work with? I mean, that's a sad thing. I don't even want to put down Starks and Big Bill because at least it was something fresh. Young Bucks FTR, no one wants to see that again. The only thing you had was the thing, like you said, they moved away from. With Jay White and Juice Robinson. Yeah, well, wait a minute. Now, you know, the, didn't the Buckaroos just win a tag team title shot? That's right, at the pay-per-view. So we're going to get to see the Buckaroos against Ricky Starks and Big Bill. Good Lord, it will bury the heels just to be in that fucking match, regardless of the finish. That Big Bill wouldn't just pick his teeth with both of those fucking imbeciles. And that if Ricky Starks is being lowered to doing tomfoolery and trampolining when they were supposedly trying to push him to be a top single. I, again, the, the world champion of AEW is defending the Ring of Honor tag team titles by himself, and Starks, the guy they were trying to push as a top heel, is now a, a, one of the tag team champions. I, 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 I don't understand. But I'm just uh, I'm trying to see if there's anything here that's firm for the Apparently, they sold 2,245 tickets for last night's collision. And, of course, the arena looked like it was a third full of what they even had allotted. It looked Well, yeah, because they, they, we've, we've established they're blocking one side of these arenas off these days, but then the, the other side wasn't. It looked like a piss hole in a snowbank. You know, it reminded me of WCW. Like, even like in 90 but now, wait, wait a minute. Salt Lake City, though. Let's be fair. I mean, unless they have a top Mormon baby face, are they really going to draw in Salt Lake City? I think they have, or other companies have in the past. You don't need a hometown boy in Salt Lake City. A you mean, you mean without, without Don Leo Jonathan? Or, you know... Some, Name another one. Who, who, another Mormon wrestler another do you Mormon know? Another Mormon wrestler. Come um, on, let's hear it. <laughs> the fucking roadkill guy was Amish, wasn't he? Brother Jonathan. That's an easy one for Brother you. John. Well, Brother Jonathan was Don Leo Jonathan's father, but I'm talking about, you know, people that would be under 110 years old. All right. You need a Mormon in Salt Lake City, I'm telling you. It's depressing, though. You know, there was times with WCW, even when I really liked it in the early 90s, like after you left, but before, you know, things really changed. No matter how much you liked it, you saw empty seats, and it was depressing. Yeah. Watching just the entrance at the beginning of the show for FTR, you look in the background, it's empty seats everywhere. Not good. It, it, it you book smaller buildings. 
And you wouldn't have that to that extent of a problem. It'd be easier to disguise if you've got 2,000 people in a 6,000 seat building instead of 2,000 people in a 16,000 seat building. They're drawing smaller and smaller crowds. The TV's getting worse and worse. They don't seem to see it that way. They're about to go head to head with NXT, which is fully loaded against them. You know, AEW has a lot of problems right now. And as always, it comes from the top, and I don't see anything changing. That's the sad thing. And I feel like it's getting to that TNA point where they got to where they were going to go. <laughs> and now, because there's money, they're going to stay there forever. Well, no. AEW hasn't, uh, they have not stayed where they got to. They've, they've tapered off. I'm saying this is where, this is the peak. Like, this no, is no, no, we're, we're, halfway, <laughs> we're halfway over the peak and down the other side. As we're about mid-level again, we're at, we're at the far side's base camp. And it, it could be a steady trickle from me. I, we don't mean to all be doom and gloom, but gee, many Christ. Even if you've got the greatest cast in the world in your movie, if the script is rotten, or the direction is rotten, or the editing is rotten, so we were seeing rotten booking, rotten production from I don't know who, theirs or TBS's or both. And then it's like they've kicked a gypsy. They get hurt constant. And they don't even they don't even get hurt doing this crazy, ridiculous bullshit that they don't need to do that they pop right back up from. They get hurt on the simple shit. And then they disappear for it. You can't, there's no consistency. Everybody argues with each other. I mean, for a while, let's realize this, they legitimately split their thin roster up just because the guys in the locker room couldn't fucking get along and Tony wouldn't make them. And you keep seeing Uncle Dave saying stuff like, well, it's just they have so much talent in AEW. No, they got a lot of wrestlers. They're short on talent. That's the problem. And if he actually came out and said that, they would excommunicate him. But I've just, it, you can, you, 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 you know can, what, to be fair, reportedly he's been a little more vocal lately about how bad things have gotten. Because you can't, well, you can't ignore it. You can't ignore it. If people would come down to Campbell by the sea and start throwing rotten tomatoes at him if he didn't say something about it that's so obvious. So, uh, point being, I don't care how good anybody thinks their favorite wrestler is, with all these other fucking issues, and a lack of experience, and a lack of leadership, in all those positions, this is what we kind of said was going to happen. They can't sustain their shit because everybody's running in a different direction and nobody's lassoing the cattle. And, and that's the and I'll, a final thing that I'll say about it is that's the thing about Vince, whether for better or for worse, that he's a workaholic, but also that he's a grown adult who will cut his mother's throat in business instead of wanting to be anybody's friend. And that's why he, and he knows everything going on. And he has an opinion on everything going on. And that's why he's been doing this for 40 years and is worth billions of dollars. And Tony's been doing it for four years. And his father's worth billions of dollars. Well, that was the AEW Collision update, ladies and gentlemen. Every, oh. every Saturday night on Turner Network, unless it's preempted or whatever else happens. Where do we go from here? It's your show. Well, I'll tell you what, because here's the thing. Brian, after watching some kind of booking malfeasance like that with FTR losing the belts, I couldn't get a good night's sleep because I couldn't get comfortable. I was tossing and turning. I was reeling and rocking until the break of dawn. I, I didn't know whether to lay on my side or lay on my back. I couldn't get up. I couldn't get down. I needed a perfect position to get some rest after, after the horrible experience that I was exposed to. And, uh, you know, but if you don't watch Collision, folks, you might still need to be able to get in a perfect position, no matter what that position may be, 
and get a good, you know, we talk about getting a good night's sleep a lot here. They can tell what our interests are here on the program. Well, new friends that we've made have combined several of our interests at the same time to make it easier for everybody. Number one, you want a good night's sleep. Number two, you want to be comfortable. Number three, you want a decent position to be in to watch these multitudinous hours of wrestling programming, right? Because we're watching all this stuff. You guys are out there. Some of you are watching all of it. And you're miserable because you're not comfortable. You're not encased in comfort while you're watching television. The answer to all that is our brand new friends at Perfect Sleep Chair. And Brian, I am jealous of you because you got your Perfect Sleep Chair and I haven't got mine yet. That's right. The way it should be. I get to have it here in the house. We all get to test it out. It's very popular. It's it's a very comfortable chair. It has these great settings on the remote. You could set it like very easily. You could pick exactly where you want to go, but like for TV, for sleep, to boost you up. And like I said, the kids like it. They like it so much I had to tell them to stop. Thought they were going to break it. But well, very... the kid, the kids like everything. But the when the adults, this is well, I, I, you know, you've got something. Yeah, this is going to be handy for the pay per views, like the AEW one specifically, where like around a three hour mark, I'm like, you know, I have to watch more, but I'd really like to lay down, but I don't want to go upstairs. Now you just press a button and lay down and watch it. Well, let hear the tantalizing thing is, you get in this perfect sleep chair, and it does everything for you while you're being exposed to the endless hours of wrestling on television. It'll heat you up if you're getting chilly. It's got the therapeutic heat setting. It'll recline if you want to lay back and boom, as Buddy Landell used to say, pop it back into loser. Or, and there's an infinite number of positions, by the way, to this recline. It's going all over the place. I mean, this thing, it, it'll, it'll fold you up like a jackknife. Or you can adjust it to a lift position so you don't even have to stand up. I mean, the only thing this chair doesn't do is when you're eating, it doesn't rub your throat so you don't have to chew and swallow. I mean, everything else for you, is there a little reach-around setting also where it'll give you the five-knuckle shuffle? No, I don't know why you would even want that, but no, there's not that, but there are great settings. You have vibration. Those are only available in Japan, I understand. I don't know what's available in Japan. They eat lots of stuff. And of course, everyone wants comfort no matter where you are. And we eat a lot of stuff here. I don't know why I said they eat a lot of stuff. But we're know. over here and you can eat a lot of stuff and just recline right back. Get ready for your favorite TV show. And you again, can eat. You can eat in this chair. And you can vibrate while you eat. So you can just shake and eat, shake and Wait eat. Wait a minute. It vibrates too? It vibrates. Well, in that case, yeah, just lay face down with your neck on the vibrator. You won't even have to chew. Well, no, that's not... The neck it'll, the it'll, it'll, vi what? it'll vibrate your teeth back and forth across the food, so that'll be perfect. I don't think this is a selling point. We want to talk about vibration of the body, of the muscles, of the... Well, it, does it vibrate like the Didolator Mach 3 for the ladies in the audience? I believe it'll be a different brand of vibration, if I well, had to guess. The Perfect Sleep Chair is made by Journey Health and Lifestyle. Steve Perry got a new gig, Journey Health and Lifestyle. Just a and small they... town chair! Living in a lonely living room. Lonely land. We took the midnight recline to Flat Town. <laughs> Journey has been making health and home products for over 20 years, and they're based right outside of Washington, D.C., so there could potentially be a politician folded up in one of these chairs when it's delivered to you. No, there'll be no bodies or no... There will be nobody delivering or delivered with the chair except for the skilled, wonderful people that will help install it and set it up in your house. And they're still alive. Uh, certainly, they'll be driving. That's Well, uh, you got to be alive to get your license. Um, they made a new rule. But nevertheless, in the perfect sleep chair world, this is perfect. I'm telling you again, up, down, back, forth. You could make weekend at Bernie's out of this thing, by the way, and, and, and you wouldn't even have to fucking flop the guy's arms around. You could just push the button and he'd move on his own. I they don't I, skimp on quality, folks. No. They're available in several fabrics, including genuine leather. Yeah. Hide, hide, the cows outside. Well, I ain't afraid of no cows. They have <laughs> sold more than 100,000 perfect sleep chairs, and they deliver the chair directly to you, so you don't need to worry about 
going out to a store, having your wife pick this chair up and sling it over her back and carry it home, and it comes in a wide variety of color choices to fit the decor of any home so you can fung your shway all over this chair with impunity. Is that not correct, Brian? That is correct. Well, that is correct. And you want to know what kind of deal you can get on this thing? Well, I'll tell you what. If you're looking for the best TV chair, the best sleep chair, the best chair to go into suspended animation in, and, and, and as a matter of fact, if you lay all the way back and you're flat down, if your wife comes and throws a tablecloth over you, they can serve lunch on you. You'll never even wake up. You'll wake you up. Do? This has nothing to do with the quality of your sleep, just the comfort. Well, be, uh, you you might wake up if somebody stabs you with a fork while they're eating the fucking first course, but otherwise you'll be comfortable. Go to Shop Journey, shopjourney.com slash JCE. Use the promo code JCE at checkout. $125 off your order. $125 right off the top of this chair. If you go to shopjourney.com slash JCE and use the promo code JCE. Again, you don't have to go to a store. You don't have to pack the thing home. You don't have to rent a truck. You don't have to have the, the dog pull it in a little red wagon. They're going to bring it right to your door. They're going to stick it in your house. If you give them extra, they'll even put it where you want it. And boom, then just lay back they'll, and they'll relax. They'll put it where you want it. As part of the delivery service, you don't have to give anyone extra, but you'll be you extra mean served do, do in terms of too? comfort. Yes. Well, well, well that's that. amazing. You could just tell it. What if you say, put it on the roof? It has to be within reason. Well, if it's who's reason? How are you going to get up on a roof? These guys aren't bringing ladders to move furniture up on a roof. They got to bring it into your house and you can well, say, put it here. Well, then they won't put it, put here. it anywhere you say. Inside the house. You know, that's, that's why the other day I was driving down the interstate, got off at an exit. There was a guy with a sign said, we'll work for food. I rolled down the window. I said, will you paint my house for an onion? He wouldn't do it. But nevertheless, right now, if you go to shopjourney.com slash JCE and use the promo code JCE, $125 off of your order at these fine people's establishment. Shop Journey. Shopjourney.com. And, and hello, Steve Perry. When the chair goes down, the reclining. Finish the song, Jim. <laughs> when, when the chair goes down, reclining, and my butt is on the ground. Oh, I want to be there for eight hours. Because if I don't get a good night's sleep, I'll be sour. Oh, I was trying to do the backing vocals, but you went completely off in another direction. So, Yo, so yeah. I was off key. So Yeah. Well, Lee, hey, I was the Bernie Taupin. I had to finish it. You had no fucking lyrics. It's your dis job after that to fucking put the tune together. You were the Bernie Madoff. You took the tune and you ran away. Hey. All Bur right. You see, Bernie Taupin just put out a book. Did you see he put out of a... What? A, he just put out a memoir. A memoir? Yeah. I remember the memoirs. They used to be big. Or biography, what, however what you want to call what it. Did he, what did he remember? He remembered writing all these hit songs for Elton John. And others, I presume. Was there any more detail to the book than that? Is that the whole book? I wrote a lot of hit songs for Elton John. You know the song, Your Song? Yes, it's it's my song. You get to find out who your is. You know who the song, Goodbye your? Yellow Brick who is, Road? Who is your? I can't spoil it for you. You got to buy the book. Is Bernie paying for this plug? No, you know, don't buy the book. I haven't even read it yet. It may suck. We just got a goddamn fortune to plug the perfect sleep chair. Now you're selling this guy's book gratis, which means he pays nothing. See, the sleep chair is awesome. Honestly, we've already had like issues where the kids want to hang out and I'm like, you can't play in this. It's my chair. Yeah. But a good thing to do would be combining a book plug with that because you just want to sit back with the book and then go to nap. And there you go. And then you fall asleep with the book on your chest in the perfect sleep chair. Perfect sleep chair. What's the code? One more time, Jim. Shop, shopjourney.com slash JCE. Use the promo code JCE at checkout. And if the kids want to get in your sleep chair, get the option where you can press a remote button and steel spikes come out the middle of it they, to discourage no. the little... 
the little tykes from lingering. They don't have that option. You would probably want to save that option for, I don't know, someone who broke into the house, not for the children. But once again, perfect sleep chair. We love it here. You will love it there. Jim will love it soon. The perfect sleep chair. They don't have a medieval torture chair option. No, I don't believe so. We didn't even get into why I didn't get my chair because they had your phone number and you took so long to give them my number. But we'll we'll do that on the next one after I've got my chair and I'm mad at you because I've been oh, stop. built was... on this wonderful chair for all this time. I thought it was a prank phone call. They kept leaving messages for Jim. We have your chair delivery. I'm like, oh yeah, oh, I'm going to yeah, fall well, for you this. Have, you know, have I'm going to fall for that Jim. one. You have nobody named Jim in your goddamn periphery, and, and it's not like that you do a podcast where uh, the sleep chair is coming up as a sponsor. So, uh, Jim, we have your chair. That, uh, there's no way you could possibly figure that out. Gee, if I was a crazy fan wanting to, I don't know, attack these people, what would I do? Oh, I would pretend I was a sleep chair well, delivery call man. A, call a motherfucker and see what he has to say for himself first before you decide he's a goddamn psychopath. Might just be an innocent delivery person trying to do his fucking job. Like he was. Giving me my shit. I can't wait till these guys deliver the chair. I can't wait till they deliver the chair and then you get mad at them and rant about them on the show after all this. I'm, well, I'm pretty goddamn pissed off right now. Well, you'll feel a lot better when you're laying down in the perfect... We're going back <laughs> to the plug. Jesus, we can't get out of the plug. <laughs> all right, let's go to SmackDown. <laughs> let's go Good back heavens. to the plug. Let's go back to the plug. Oh, yeah, the hell who go back. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'll tell you, you know, last week, this guy broke into my wife's apartment. She yelled rape. He yelled no. Anyway, let's go back to SmackDown while we have to. Because it's setting up obviously the big fast lane pay-per-view and at least it's only two hours it's not like raw but the the opening segment i was kind of proud of them because they they did a lot of what we've been talking about la night comes out get the big reaction and the big chant and let me talk to you and as soon as that happens Heyman interrupts ladies and gentlemen and out he comes with Uso and Solo, Oprah, Uma. And then he says, you know, he puts L.A. Knight over in his smarmy way as he does and butters him up. But now that L.A. Knight has the bloodline's attention, you just know we're going to have to do something about that. And L.A. Knight kind of fired back at Paulie's jowls a little bit. But then Uso just jumps in. He's making all the decisions. He's like, you just, you ain't making it to fast lane. And here come the heels to menace L.A. Knight around the ring. Which is the perfect time to play some John Cena music. And at least, have you noticed when they play the music because they have to, because it's John Cena, he still doesn't come out and pose and scratch his ass and do his whole entrance because there's a guy in trouble. He gets right to the ring. And when he gets in the ring and they dare the heels to come in, then Paul E calls him back. And L.A. Knight is trying to goad Jimmy Uso into a match for tonight. And Paul's saying, no, no, no. And so, of course, Jimmy says, yeah, I'll do it. And Paul freaks out about that. And they got that done in eight or nine minutes. They started with a, a recap package of the the issues, so we knew where we stood, and did that did that live bit, and we were still only like 11, 12 minutes into the show. That wasn't bad. We got all the fucking stars out there. We set up the main event. We let everybody see everybody, and we got the fuck out of there without doing a goddamn soliloquy. What do you think of Heyman's look? Oh, that, well, let's save it for the pay-per-view. <laughs> save it for the pay-per-view, because there was an opening there. But what do you think of the uh, the way they set this uh, situation up? You know, I like the way they've... If they're really going to go with LA Knight, it looks like they are. I like the way they've used him with Cena. Cena is the bigger star, but he hasn't... They haven't used him so that he has to flex that he's the biggest star, and he hasn't acted like he has to flex that either. L.A. Knight has not become the little buddy or the best friend. He's That's a right. guy, help. he's a star helping the, the big star. 
it's the big star from the past needing the big star of now or one of the big stars of now to help him as opposed yeah. to like you said a little buddy it, 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 if my famous line about Horner, if this was a movie, you'd be the best friend. This is not the case. But then I, I praised them for their brevity. And then we got Charlotte and Oscar against Bailey and EO. And by the time that thing was over with, we were 35 minutes into the show. And again, I'm, I love Charlotte. She's a superstar but I was running low on time. Uh, what were your random thoughts? My random thoughts are no disrespect to anyone involved, but <laughs> there's only so much wrestling that we can watch in a week. And there's certain things that aren't going to interest me. And, and that know, was one of them. And that was one of them. And I had a feeling it was going to go a while and it was going to have yeah. a lot of commercial. So even if you want to like it, the commercial breaks are going to kill it. And that's what happened. Well, Roman Reigns returns next week on SmackDown on Fox, I'll have you know. And a lot of people are wondering what he's going to be saying about a lot of things. So again, the star power is continuing. And now they're talking about Cena's already, you know, made the statement that when the strike is over, he's got to get back to a production. He won't be able to wrestle anymore because of insurance and you can't do both. And, you know, and I don't blame him. But they got Roman Reigns uh, coming back into the pipeline and they've got access to other names that people recognize and also and Pat McAfee or Logan Paul that uh, are not even going to consider being involved in AEW. They're starting to give the rub to guys like Braun Breaker with Heyman going down there for that. Yeah, so, I mean, this is starting to look like the fucking... Glory days of the Chicago Bears against the fucking Bad News Bears. The but anyway. The idea of the writer strike, though, that also changes any ideas anyone would have with The Rock. Well, but uh, we didn't imagine Rock was going to be bopping back and forth. You know, he's still got other things going on. And I would imagine that, again, if they're going to do something for WrestleMania, that's probably already been said if it ain't said it's about to be set because they have to plan that kind of shit that far ahead so they could be tickling our taint about this whole thing now and know exactly what's going on but it's not like you're going to call and they understand that you're going to call Dwayne Johnson and say hey can you be at TV in two weeks the fuck he schedules his shits but they got a lot of stars more stars than there are in the heavens, as they say. Okay, so speaking of stars, the two top heel groups, the Judgment Day and the Bloodline, Judgment Day have, uh, I'm sorry, backwards, Bloodline have wandered into their locker room and found the Judgment Day sitting there. And now they're having a face-off. And Rhea, who's the boss of the, the group, Tells everybody to get out so she and Paul can chat. And they all leave, but you know, you can see they milk Priest and Solo last, and Priest leaves when Rhea asks him to, and then Paul does the same with Solo. And then Rhea looks at him and says, Let's talk. And then they go back to the desk where the announcers are saying, Boy, we wish we could be a fly on the wall for that conversation. Well, there's an HD video camera in the fucking room. Tell the director, take the goddamn shot. You wouldn't have to be a fly. You could watch it on your monitor. Yeah, they don't seem to mind him. He's been standing there the whole time. Yes. He's the only one who wasn't told to leave for the private meeting. It was the national television camera yeah. instead of the people being talked about. If any of this ever ends in a lawsuit, he's the one guy that's going to be deposed because he saw everything. He was in the room for everything. Yeah. Uh, we need to uh, subpoena that footage. But that, uh, all right. But anyway, so then the feature match pretty much of the, uh, the most of this program before the main event was Bobby Lashley against Rey Mysterio and Profits and the LWO in the corners. And if there was ever a visual that stretched credulity I know Ray is a, you know, an icon and a Hall of Famer, and but, oh boy, 
And of course, you know, they Lashley dominates with his physicality and Ray opens up with speed and agility and same formula as the match. You know, they do not they specifically, but the WWE does two minutes to the break, come back, replay. They come back on a bear hug where they're immobile in the ring and then replay uh, Lashley nearly breaking Ray in half on the ring post during the break. But anyway, so then they pretty much work a two minute bear hug, but what can Lashley do over and over to Ray without it being ridiculous that this giant's not killing him? So then they do the uh, boom, boom, boom. Ray makes his comeback. And Lashley catches him and knocks him to the floor and then throws him back in the ring and just dumps Escobar over the railing. And as Escobar is out of the picture, they do a little back and forth going for the 619. And the Prophets and LWO get in a big fight. And Ray dives on top of the Prophets. And then Lashley spears Ray 1-2-3. It was a really good, exciting finish the last couple of minutes, but the camera missed the LWO guy taking a fucking giant German suplex on the floor. And, but they replayed it at the end. But it, nevertheless, except for the last two minutes, which was, you know, really up, this was kind of... Eh, eh, eh. Yeah, I can't add too much to that. You've uh, had a collection of sounds today, and I think that fits this segment. Yes, but the LWO was left down, and the two younger Stooges were pretty much wiped out, which plays into the pay-per-view the next day. So then Rhea and Pauly are still in the back, and the pitch that Rhea is making to Paul is that the Judgment Day and the Bloodline are stronger together. And Paul's, I like it. It's really good. I'll make a call and get the okay. And Rhea says, it's authorized. And Paul said, well, the tribal chief is the only one that can give the okay to something like this. And Rhea says, says to Paul, acknowledge me. I'm authorizing it. And Paul doesn't like that. And that's when Rhea says, well, you'll, you'll acknowledge me or you'll find out which group is, is stronger. So make your little phone call. And she walks off and he calls Roman Reigns. So now are they going to be together or are they going to fight? We don't know. But again, I'm loving Rhea Ripley as a goddamn movie star. She is the Marilyn Monroe of the generation, I'm telling you. It is intriguing, too, the idea of Judgment Day versus Bloodline. Even though what's the Bloodline at this point? There's only, I guess, two members and a third maybe member and... Paul. Well, but something's going to happen sooner or later. You can. It's three guys can, and Paul Heyman. I mean, what are you? What are they going to do? Three guys and Paul. Uh. Anyway, Austin Theory. Apparently, he's got heat with the office. Jesus Christ! It was Theory versus Dragon Lee. And I said, as much as I love Theory, again, I'm running low on time. And Theory cut a promo before the bell, which I listened to because he's great. He put himself over it. He shit on Dragon Lee and he had really good delivery. And then I figured I'd zip to the finish and see how Theory wins. And suddenly Grimes was there posting Grayson Waller and Dragon Lee rolled up Theory and beat him one, two, three. And, oh. They have to put stumbling blocks in people's path, don't they? You, you unforced know, errors is what they call them. You know, I can't say that theory has. Yeah. I mean, again, the booking's a large part of it, but there's nothing that he's done in the last six months since WrestleMania, or whatever, that really has elevated him further. You keep waiting for it. I'm not going to go crazy over this. I like Dragon Lee. If they're going to do something with Dragon Lee, that includes Cameron Grimes somehow getting a push. <laughs> Waller's, yeah, it, Waller's the only one in here I'm not a big fan of, actually. I, it's not that I'm not, I don't like Grimes, but uh, uh, Dragon Lee ain't going to be a fucking main event guy. I'm sorry. Right. I'll, not everyone I'll, needs to be a main event guy. Okay, well, Theory's going to be. And Grimes isn't going to be because they're not going to use him that way because of his size and physique. So the point is, I don't mind Theory doing jobs, but why is he? And, and the Waller thing is not going to fucking work. 
And so they've teamed Theory up with Waller. They've got him interacting with Grimes and doing jobs to Dragon Lee. I'm saying I, I don't like the cast of characters that he's immersed in. If he's going to get beat, at least somebody, somebody that's somebody. Or in if can he stand out beside in any other way than his work, which is still great, in my opinion, if he's being used with middle card fucking guys? Hmm. He right now he's a middle card guy. He's not, well, that's like the I said, he's not broken out. And Dragon Lee is someone new to the roster. They're obviously trying to get him over a little bit. They're using theory right now for whatever that's worth to get him over a little bit. And we'll see where they go with this. But I don't think it's going to hurt theory right now, just because I think he's in that weird spot of something has to happen, but there's enough not happening right now that he's just there. Well, you say theory hadn't broken out, but the thing is they've got him in maximum security and they've taken away the fucking bed sheets. He was making the rope out of. So he's trying to break out, but it's more difficult there at the Supermax than it is over in Mayberry at the county jail. But now it's time for our main event of the evening. L.A. Knight and Jimmy Uso. And I've got to, again, I love L.A. Knight's work. They had nice pace, nice wrestling spots. They kept it moving. The work was pretty solid. I'll save talking about a habit that both the Usos have developed uh, on the pay-per-view review. But Uso gets the break, and then they come, or, or gets the break. Uso gets the heat for the break, and then they come back, and L.A. Knight's fighting back, makes his comeback, L.A. elbow, here comes Solo, DQ, boom. They start a second of heat, here comes Cena, and he tosses Solo out. And then Judgment Day music. And then here they all come out. And I think JD's there with them. And Paul and Rhea stare at each other, and then they shake hands. And Paul says, it's authorized. So they're together. Or at least, you know, on the same side against other people. And then all the heels get up on the apron to menace Cena and L.A. Knight. And the Uso music plays, and it's Jay. Well, now, a minute ago... The announcers were set all these these eight heels against these two baby faces. These guys are fucked. And suddenly one more guy comes out and the heels all pause. But then Cody music plays. And now it's only four against eight. And Cody hits the rig. The fans are singing his song because it got cut off early because he ran in on the run in. And then the fight starts and boom, boom, boom. And the baby faces prevail and hit all their moves on jd mcfunco and i think cena hit two of them and that's the way we went off the air to go to the, so they took the opposite approach that bill watts used to before the big show he wants to get some heat before the big pay-per-view they just kicked the shit out of all the heels that when the baby faces were outnumbered two to one interesting approach keep the baby faces strong the heels are indecisive, I guess you could only say. <laughs> it made sense for Jimmy Uso to come off the apron when Jay came out because there's still that weird, you know, they're brothers and they're, yeah. you know, they still talk about each other, but they also hate each other. And we'll see what happens. But it was a good uh, ending going into the pay per view, I think. Well, there was a lot of action, but again, but. We had four I baby faces thing... in there that were really, I mean, listen to the crowd reaction. LA Knight's getting ridiculous reactions. Yeah. They were chanting Cody's name. Cody was getting a big reaction. Yeah. They love Jey Uso and Cena. Every time he comes out there, they go nuts. It says something nowadays. You don't usually see four guys that over in the ring at one time as baby faces. That's because there's usually not four guys over that way as baby faces at the same time. Or hasn't been in about 25 years. So basically, all of those things together set up the, the big fast lane pay-per-view. And you know, Brian, that's the thing is that you got you got to sell these things. It's no it's no matter how good the product is, or how quality it is, it, you got to sell the thing. You got to have a a platform like they've got the big TV network. You got to have a platform. You got to have a store. You got to have a method 
a way to do these things. And that's what our friends at Shopify give you. As a matter of fact, you've put the kids to work, haven't you? They're, no. They're, 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 doing, they're doing crafts in the basement now to earn extra money. And I, I understand you got them a Shopify account set up and everything so they can market this stuff around the world. I don't know why this is the example you would choose. No, the kids do their own crafts and stuff. I do not use them to produce anything. I actually have lots of other things I could sell on Shopify. Lots of great wrestling stuff. Well, see, now, what you ought to do is you ought to, you ought to get busy. You ought to get busy now and get everybody notified that Shopify is the number one online platform, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? And then it, it's followed by the there's a guy from the IRS at the front door stage. But nevertheless, Shopify is there to help you all the way from start to prison. Whether you're auctioning autographed apparel or selling sleek skis, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. You know what that means, don't you, Brian? That doesn't mean just, just here in the United States. That means here, Guatemala, Bolivia, the Arctic Circle, anywhere there's somebody that wants to buy your product, Shopify will sell it. And they've got that in-person POS system. We've talked about that many times. They can tell in person up close whether a person is a piece of shit or not and reject their business. But Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, which has been noted to be up to 36% better compared to the other leading commerce platforms that have converting checkouts. So that's, they got that going for them. But anyway, did you know, Brian, I'll have you know, this is a fact that you should be aware of. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. So if, if they decided to, they could just, they could wreak havoc on the global economy. And Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success every step of the way. You call them up and you say, hey, I got this problem or I got that problem. They'll tell you to have a few drinks and go to bed. So right now, if you'd like to have Shopify selling your stuff, whether you want to put your kids to work in the basement or put your wife to work in the, the parlor or whatever room of the house, make extra money, grow your own business, become a successful big business typhoon, an entrepreneur. Right now, go to shopify.com slash JCE. Shopify.com slash JCE right now to grow your business into a giant, erect, throbbing concern instead of a flaccid, soft, money-losing enterprise. No matter what stage of the game you're in, shopify.com slash JCE and sign up for a $1 a month trial period. For heaven's sake, at shopify.com slash JCE, and that slash of JCE, by the way, as we've mentioned before, all lowercase. I don't know what the fuck that has to do with anything, but shopify.com slash JCE, all lowercase, to grow your business now from a, a little acorn to a mighty oak tree. Well, Brian, before we move into the fast lane and pass all this traffic, what are you doing over at the Arcadian Vanguard Network this fine week? Well, you could stay in the left lane on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network and information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Of course, the wrestling news each and every day. Get the wrestling news direct to you. Get it from thewrestlingnews.com or subscribe wherever you find your favorite podcast for your free daily wrestling newscast every morning with a lot more to come stay tuned to the wrestling news once again the what's, wrestling news.com what's the name of that program the wrestling news arcadian vanguards the wrestling news and what does it give you it gives you the wrestling news any other questions sir no I'm fine. i believe you're still on the staff of the wrestling news technically contractually <laughs> yes all right well i'm trying to make news well, speaking of news, someone who always makes news or writes about news is this week's guest on Stick... Uh, 
I shut up and wrestle with Brian Solomon. <laughs> His guest is Tim Hornbaker, the author of the new Rick oh, Flair thank biography. Oh, Horner. Thank God it's not Horner. I guess you'd think I was going there. Tim Hornbaker, not Tim Horner. Tim Horner hasn't written any books that I know of. <laughs> yeah, he's never even read one. He maybe doctored the books. I really don't know, but get Tim Hornbaker's, uh, well, don't, well get his book, but <laughs> hear him interviewed with Brian Solomon. I shut up and wrestle with Brian Solomon. S-U-A-W pod.com. Look for it wherever you find your favorite podcast. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. Oh, quit. Go through the archive today. 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. <laughs> the Mothership. Folks, the rest of the podcast will be done by Clem Cadiddlehopper. So then we watch the fast lane. Oh, hey, boy. can I say the worst thing about WWE Fastlane? Yes. Every replay they showed had that noise of like a car speeding by. Every time they like <laughs> went to it, and then every time it ended, it was like, <laughs> and then they had to see the replay. It, it's disturbing to our canine friends. The dogs think the, the cars are rushing by, and they want to go chase them. I, there was a couple of things on here I wish would have gone and chased some cars. We watched an AEW pay-per-view last week. And we watched the WWE pay-per-view this week. WWE pay-per-view, two hours and 45 minutes long, a show with five matches. When it's over, you say, is that it? And AEW is a show It's five and a half hours long with 14 matches. And at the end of it, you say, please be it. I don't think there's anything in the, in the middle anymore, is there? It's a weird thing with these WWE pay-per-views. This is the maybe the third or fourth time it's happened where midway through the show, I thought that was the end. I was like, oh, that's a nice, pleasing pay-per-view. And there's still <laughs> a few more matches, but not that many. What were there, five matches, six matches? Yeah, I just said five. Five You're matches. Listed, five matches. So I just got out of the time machine. It's like, you know, you get concussed. It's yeah, like, you get, yeah, you, you got the time lag. Yeah. But the, the point is, again, and I mentioned it, I think earlier in this program that we did, if they're going to bore you with nothing or bore you with chaos, the people who bore you with the nothing with the stars are going to beat the people who bore you with the fucking chaos that don't make sense. And that's what's happening. They had 14,000 people in Indianapolis or whatever sold out. Although, my God, Indianapolis 50 years ago got Bruiser and Crusher against the Valiants and the Blackjacks, right? And now this. The the thing about Indianapolis was a great wrestling town, and and I watched it for years. The preliminaries sucked. Just preliminary matches to get guys over. The people came for the two main events, one of whom usually involved Dick the Bruiser, and all of he was God, and Heenan was over like crazy, and all of Bruiser's opponents were over, and that was chaos and blood and violence and everything else. Man. I have to think if you if you put somebody in the time machine from Indianapolis in 1972 and they left watching Bruiser and Crusher against the Blackjacks and they came back to watch any of this show, they would think, what the, what the fuck are we looking at? What has gone on here? It's, it's nothing like what was called professional wrestling in a previous era. You can still recognize baseball and football and basketball, but not wrestling. Uh, anyway, the first match was for the tag team title, Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso against uh, Damian, Damian Finn and Judgment Priest. God damn, we've been watching a lot of Damian Priest and Finn Judgment. And Finn's judgment is very thin being involved in this group. And I, I wanted to like this because Cody's involved. But you answer me honestly. Was this kind of, it was it a TV match with no commercials? It was just kind of slow and, and didn't kick in until right at the finish. It just, it went by. The finish was really hot and the fans were really into yeah. it. And they were surprised, I think, to even get the title change. But it took forever. They drew everything out. And again, I guess when you're going to do a three-hour pay-per-view with five matches, 
You're going to try to draw those tag matches out as long as you can. Well, boy, they certainly did. And that's a, a couple of, you know, minor points with me. Both the Usos, I mentioned this earlier, I was going to talk about it. They're doing the fucking slap punch to a ridiculous degree. And I'm not talking about the slap sound effect. I'm talking about they actually open their hand and they don't throw a punch. They ball it up and in the swing, they open it and they're slapping guys. And not only you can see it if you're looking, but we've all got DVRs now. We got slow-mo. It's obvious. And they're not even laying the slap in. That's the end. Priest is doing the open hand and turning his arm and slapping the sound effect at the same time. And guys, Jesus Christ, fucking hell. I wouldn't let, I wouldn't let those punches on OVW television. And here we are going around the world. But anyway, like you said, at the finish, the boom, 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 they were really cooking. And at the point, you know, Rhea at one point hits Uso with the briefcase, gets a two count. And then Priest clears the desktop off. And JD has the case, but he swings at Cody and hits Priest's bad leg that he's been selling. And then Jay did a dive. And Cody and Jay hit a double team. And Cody hit the crossroads on Finn. One, two, three. And boom, there you go. The, the baby face is one. The, as you said, the last two or three minutes was great, but boy, it took them a long fucking time to get there, and they weren't setting a fucking canvas on fire. It took them a long time to get there, and then once they got there, you know, after the match, I was like, you know, there's an interesting wrinkle in the whole bloodline thing. They had to do something new. Now Cody had to get him back into everything with Roman. Now he's teaming up, and he's tag champions with Jey Uso. Yeah. You know, I almost so, like I almost like what could possibly happen more than everything that led to whatever <laughs> the finish was. Again, I thought the finish was really hot and the fans were really into it. Whatever you want to say about the slow pacing, for the guys that are over, WWE fans have shown they're willing to sit through that. Yes. Because they're still going to be there at the end because they're waiting for it. They know it's coming. For the guys that are over. And yes. then the guys that ain't over, they try to go 100 miles an hour and run off and leave people because they ain't over anyway. And I never know. Uh, pointed uh, again, new tag team champions, and you know we've got a variety of ways that uh, that they can go with this. So again, I'm saying pay per view. It's premium live event. Nobody buys this thing anymore except me, so I can watch it on real television. And they've taken these big shows to just sometimes. Well, we just need to get this guy in that position to set up something else. It's not. We used to have pressure every month. What's the pay-per-view lineup? What are the matches? What's drawing the money? What's selling this thing? What can we dig into? What's the Undertaker doing? What's the champion doing? You know, usually all hands on deck. Everybody's available to fucking pick from. It was the most important thing. And now it's kind of, eh. These are a few good matches. There's no pressure. Anyway. Speaking of no pressure, uh, then we had the six-man tag team match with Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits against Rey Mysterio and Pablo Escobar, and they don't have a third partner because the other two guys got wiped out on SmackDown, and allegedly Rey had made a phone call, but, you know, nobody comes out, right? So they're going to do this two on three. And... <laughs> In here somewhere is is the the remnants of a wrestling angle that one of these writers has seen or heard about or watched on YouTube, but I've I've never actually seen it done this way before. And I will get into that here in a second when the third guy comes out. But uh, basically, this started at 100 miles an hour, but the fans didn't care, really, because I think they were... I don't know what they were waiting for, but pro probably to see who the third guy was going to be. Because I mean, some people had signs for him, so it was a big secret. But, again, the match, eh. Ray gets in and fires him up, but if he's not doing something, it was kind of there. And then they got heat on Ray, and 
jerked Escobar off the apron to where he couldn't tag in and Ray kept trying to go for the tag, but he didn't have a partner. And then finally, Ray fires up a little bit and knocks the heels to the floor and music starts playing. And here comes Carlito. And he's dressed to wrestle. Here's the goddamn question I have. If he was already there, why, and already willing to be their partner, why did he wait till both of them had got the shit kicked out of them before he came out? Brad, the angle that they were trying to do was the babyface late in arriving, and the other babyfaces don't want to lose their opportunity at whatever, revenge, championship, whatever, so they go it alone. But when they get in trouble, here comes the fucking third guy in street clothes with a suitcase, right? He just got there. Is this what they were trying to do? I don't know. Maybe Carlito was with Darby filming like a vignette video to oh, quit now. drive up. I mean, it's poorly I'm done. I'm asking you an honest to It's God poorly quit. done because it doesn't make any sense that all of a sudden he would be there in his gear calmly walking in a ring after all of this had happened. Was he by the monitor? Yes, he was. Well, of course he was. And they did that so it would get a pop at the end of the match that nobody cared about because their bad booking didn't make them care. But no, there's a way to make And they didn't want him to work the whole sense. match. Whatever that says, they didn't want him to work the whole match. Why not? Yeah, but maybe he didn't get tagged in. I did. But this was the first thing that got the people. Because out he comes, he gets the tag, he makes a comeback, hits the backstabber, one, two, three. So that that was fine from that point, but again, it took him a while to get there. But I, it, why wait? Why wait? He's here. And the only reason to wait is for the pop. And that means that it's laid out, choreographed, phony, scripted, whatever the fuck, and that this guy didn't care that his friends were getting a shit kicked out of him for the previous 15 minutes. He wanted his entrance. It. <clears throat> and one more thing I noticed. Carlito in OVW was one of the smallest guys on the roster. And here, when everybody held their, their hands up, he looked like Luger. He was a giant. Not just with Ray, with Escobar, with the referee, with everybody. Uh, what'd you think? Am I just cranky now because I've seen so much of this? I mean, the match didn't really do it for me. And it was kind of like a, you know, I don't want to say like a holding match, but it was it was just a match there to me. Carlito was, I was never a big Carlito fan, but obviously got a big pop and people remember him. I and mean, it's been a long time. It was fine. I mean, I can't rip it but i can't say i liked it i don't know what you want me to say i uh I, well no, i don't want I you to say it. anything but you're you came you saw and you left yeah i mean it was fine with it it's nice i guess that he has a job with wwe again and we'll see how they use him is he gonna join the lwo will he take over the lwo well how many people are they allowed to have is there a fucking salary cap on these factions because they got uh What's the, what's the one guy, Born to be Wild, and the other guy is Benicio Del Toro, and then you got Escobar, and you got Ray, and you got Zelina. That's five. Now you got Carlito. There's six. Maybe. This thing's fucking taking over here. Anyway, so then the SUV pulled up, and the door opened, and the silver high-heeled boot came out, and it was Jane Cargill stepping into the fucking... WWE being greeted by Triple H, big handshake, great chatting conversation. Was that her wrestling gear or was that a street clothes outfit? Man, she was almost nude. I don't I mean, think she could wrestle in that, and I don't think she walks around in the street like that, but that's the I'm a star and I'm arriving. And that was the thing. She looked like she was in a superhero costume. If the superhero was, uh, you know, swinging around a pole at the fucking mouse's ear. The mouse's ear. <laughs> that, that was the, the in Knoxville. Primary, I know. I that know. was the premier establishment in Knoxville, Tennessee, I'll have you know. I remember I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even there. But, um, but she, yeah, she looked fantastic. And, and, but she, 
walked in in that, and off they went. So Triple H was having a closed-door meeting with Jane Cargill for the rest of the night. She has arrived. You know, she obviously presents herself in a certain way. You'd be stupid not to go with that, but you have to think they're also sending a message to anyone they're ever going to want from AEW. Look at how much better we've already presented her than she was presented there for a couple of years as an undefeated champion. And there you are. Speaking of championships, the women's championship was on the line in a three-way. And I can't believe I've gotten sold that I don't want to watch three women in a three-way, but Charlotte versus Oscar versus EO. And again, Charlotte's a superstar, but I was running low on time, and I figured this one's going to take a while too. And you might chastise me because your, your, your favorite Oscar was involved. But basically, Charlotte got the figure eight on Oscar, and Oscar was tapping, but Bailey had the referee drawn, and EO moonsaulted Charlotte while she was in the bridge, which looked cool as shit, by the way. And boom, and, and although I'm glad nobody got their leg broke, I don't exactly know how they did that. And boom, one, two, three. So EO comes out the winner. Fill in the blanks on me there, Brian. What, what great grappling action did we skip over there i skipped over it okay yeah i didn't really want to watch it nothing against anyone in the match but you know it's a weird pay-per-view it's like there were no feuds settled there were it's like no title i mean the tag titles actually did change hands but like nothing got it was just a furtherance it was almost like a tv like you said a tv show without commercials on a saturday night to paraphrase kevin sullivan it was a maintenance pay-per-view it just kept everything running right along, but we didn't break any new ground. Yeah. Except Pat McAfee got in the ring, and I bet he broke some wind, if not new ground. He's a hometown boy in Indianapolis, got a big response. People like seeing him, add star power. He's a celebrity. And he may, he, work, call, he may work better with Michael Cole than Corey Graves does. It hit me watching this. Well, yeah. And it, it, I'm sure it hit you and you saw stars, but uh, I, I wish they, I wish we saw more McAfee. But anyway, he called for a WrestleMania in Indianapolis and got a big pop. And then he was the one to introduce John Cena. And then Cena music entrance, big pop, LA night music entrance, big pop. Here come the bloodline. And now we've got L.A. Knight and John Cena against Jimmy Uso and Solo with Paul Heyman in the corner, and this is one half of the double main event. <laughs> We're going to go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Remember I, told, remember I told you earlier that this is multiple pay-per-views now? I thought a match was the end of the show, and I kept yes. going. This was the match. I thought this was the main event, the end of the show. Yeah, well, because the last match was the last match, not because nobody could follow it, but because nobody wanted to fucking sit there and wait on it to be over. I'm sure if Cena found out what they were doing, he said, put me in before that so I can be on my way by the time they're done. And that's... It, you couldn't have been farther apart in these main events. One of them was all psychology, told a story, accomplished pretty much every point they wanted to accomplish, whether you agree with those points or not, and was pretty much perfectly done to give the people exactly what they came to see. And the other one was the biggest bunch of horse shit I've ever seen in my fucking life. And we will detail both of those here briefly. With L.A. and Cena's match, and by the way, this was where the announcers even started talking about Paul E. for... What was it, a few weeks ago, I said, what is he, coloring his hair with a Sharpie? He had, like, skunk stripes. Not, not like a salt and pepper type of thing, but, like, gray and then a black stripe and gray and a black stripe. It looked like he was with Pepe Le Pew crawling under the fucking fence. And now it's all gray, what's left of it, at least. And the announcer started making fun of it. Well, look, Paul's hair has turned gray. What's going on here? He's aging in front of our eyes. And it's intentional, clearly. He's so nervous about what's going on with Roman, and Roman's not around, and he's dealing with all the stress, and he's watching Jimmy Uso do things, and he can't stop him, and Solo's going along with it. 
Heyman is finally reacting to the stress. But here's the thing. He's really aging. It's not a work. All it took was him not dyeing his hair and not well, painting his face it. orange. Now he looks like Alfred Hitchcock in his frenzy stage. In black and white. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, you know, I'm 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 concerned for Paul's health. He looks like he's he's doing the reverse Benjamin Button thing. He's got to, it's the picture of Paul Heyman instead of Dorian Gray. He's he's literally turning to dust in front of us. Poor fella. I'm glad I'm only a few years older than he is. But anyway, nevertheless, let's get back to the match. So the way that they did this was perfect because Cena starts, and uh, you were talking about earlier that L.A. Knight is getting the rub but not being the little buddy. And this was constructed exactly to, to make L.A. Knight a star instead of the little buddy. They got John in, Cena, at the start, and he shined a little bit. And then Solo cut him off, and they got the heat on Cena for the next fucking 10 minutes. And L.A. Knight had never gotten in yet. So not only was he going to get a pop when he got the hot tag, but it was going to be a bigger pop because they hadn't seen him do anything yet. They made them want it. And, you know, that's why, again, the other Uso doing the open-handed punches. And it, this was a, a complete working match. Psychology. Cena's not going to take any risks. He can't. He'd be an idiot. He's got to go back and do a movie or finish a movie or whatever. But the way they built this with personalities involved, he didn't need to dive off the goddamn biggest ladder in the world. And we review AEW, we talk about the thousands of things that they do wrong or is stupid. With WWE, they don't do very much wrong because, as we mentioned, they don't do very much at all but you understand the point they're trying to make so anyway finally cena fought up a little bit gave uso an attitude adjustment both of them sold and solo stopped the tag and then solo hit him with a bonsai drop but tried a second one and cena nutted him and that's when cena hit the tag to la night after they were 12 minutes into the match the first time They'd seen L.A. Knight, and he came in and got a huge pop and did all of his shit. He made a big comeback. He only got stopped by an Uso super kick so that Uso could miss off the top, and L.A. Knight could hit his power slam and L.A. elbow. And then Solo stopped him with a Samoan drop, but Cena came off the top with a cross body and leveled fucking Solo. And then Uso splashed Cena, and everybody was down which gave L.A. Knight a chance to come back up and beat Dusty Rhodes. Did you love the left and right jabs? I thought Uso and Solo did a good job standing there taking it so it didn't look ridiculous. <laughs> because it is ridiculous, but the people were loving it, and that's the thing. That's a test. Dusty Rhodes was God to the fans in his day, so when he did the goddamn Three Stooges elbow and the flip-flop and fly and the whatever the fuck, they bought it. And Steve Austin, we've talked about it. When he stomped the mud hole in people with those fake fucking kicks in the corner, it was Austin, and they bought it. And there's L.A. Knight giving one guy left and one guy right, and they're stooging for it, and the people are buying it. So And they're yawing it. Yeah, 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 every time he fucking hits them. That's a, a litmus test for whether or not, when you can do this ridiculous shit and the people are not rolling their eyes, there you go. Anyway, then they got L.A.'s leap to the top rope and superplex in on Jimmy Uso, and then Cena got the five-knuckle shuffle, and L.A. Knight hit his finish on Uso, one, two, three. And the right team win. It was the one. It was the right finish. L.A. Knight is standing comparable to John Cena. And the heels didn't really suffer for this because they're going to come back and get some more fucking heat. 
So I, this was the best thing on the on the show to me. The heels didn't suffer too because the story wasn't them losing. It was what will Roman Reigns' reaction be to them losing. So you don't even care yeah. that they lost. You just want to see what the repercussions will be. Yeah, it, it, you're already looking past that. It wasn't, oh my God, this is the most momentous thing ever that they lost. It was like, well, now, whatever Roman's going to say about this may be the most momentous thing ever. So that that was the best thing on the show. But we still had more thing. And boy, did Cena really do everything he could to get LA Knight over. And at the end, when he did the thing where he tried to lift up LA Knight's arm to give him the rub, LA Knight yes. actually turned it down. And what a smart thing to do if they hadn't planned it out. What a smart thing to do. Not that he gave Cena the rub, but he gave all the attention to Cena. Well, but no, but in response to the end, yes, it was planned out. I can guarantee you. But by, see, here's the thing. And probably, John probably said this. If L.A. Knight had raised Cena's hand right off the bat, then all the attention would have gone to Cena as the big star. L.A. Knight goes to raise, or I'm sorry, Cena goes to raise L.A. Knight's hand, and that would have got a pop, right? But L.A. Knight being deferential to the star obviously stops it and raises his hand, and then the attention went on, jo on L.A. Knight raising John Cena's hand, and L.A. Knight looks like a fucking a nicer guy for it. You see what I'm saying? So just that little bit of interplay, it changed the dynamic from, again, it, it, it wasn't like he just went over and did it first, like, yeah, this is the big star and I'm glad to be with him. The big star was going to do it first, but the new big star said, oh, no, no, I'm much too humble. Allow me. Give the old guy a round of applause, folks. That it changes, just little things like that changes the way people see things. You know, the way L.A. Knight has gotten over and the kind of reactions he's getting is such a great argument for the average wrestling fan wants people who act like they're stars, not people who are into the aw shucks. It's my dream to be here. I've always wanted this. I want you to be my friend. Yeah. No, they want people who seem like they're stars and he acts like it. He willed himself in a way to be this. And they want people who act like wrestlers. And, for, you know, people who want to knock him say, well, he's acting like the guys in the Attitude Era. Yeah, all the guys that were over, they were drawing big money, had huge crowds coming to see him. You want to act like them? What the fuck's the matter with you? Dipshits. But then it moved on. The last match of the evening was the last man standing match for the world heavyweight title number three with Seth Franklin Rollins against Shaky Nakamura. And Brian, I mentioned that I was going to invoke the Marx Brothers principle about this match. And you're a big Marx Brothers fan. Massive. And I thought of this because as I was trying to sit through this, Watching them do everything, everything, everything that every other fucking outlaw, independent goofball does in these garbage matches, I thought of the Marx Brothers. And for those of you who don't know the Marx Brothers, before they got in the movies, they were huge stars in vaudeville, but then they were the biggest comedy stars on Broadway. And they were starring in plays on Broadway in the big theaters. As a matter of fact, the first few movies, four or five, that they made were adaptations of their Broadway plays. I actually just got a book. It's, so it's here in my office by Robert S. Bader, Four of the Three Musketeers. It's a history of the Marx Brothers on stage. And they were brilliant. They were some of the biggest stars in the, in the business at the time. And they were unique. They had some of the best Comedy writers of the day, George S. Kaufman and uh, Sid Perelman and fucking uh, Burt Ruby and uh, all these people, the writers would give them the premise. They'd put them in a hotel resort or they'd put them in a foreign country or they'd put them into goddamn opera house or whatever. And they would write a script where they had interaction with these other characters. And then they would hand it to the Marx Brothers and the Marx Brothers would do their fucking thing with it. 
because they were unique. Nobody could be the Marx Brothers. Nobody could do that shit. And the Marx Brothers, individually, were all unique. Groucho was the wise-ass. Chico was the fucking shady guy. Harpo was the goddamn, the, the mute, playful, boyish charm guy. And they all had different, and Zeppo was Zeppo. And they all had different talents. They all stood out. But the point is, there's a story that may be apocryphal. It may be true. They were on Broadway one night in a theater. And one of the writers is in the back talking to one of the critics. And they're having a conversation. And suddenly, the writer tells the guy, says, Shh, shut up. I think I just heard one of the original lines. Because it was still the same location and the same set and the same characters named the same thing, but the Marx Brothers would do their own shit with it. And that's why it made it completely unique and nothing else was like it. And in wrestling, the relationship between the booker and the top talent used to be the same way. I w the booker will give you the premise, why you're mad or what you're fighting over and suggestions of, of the interaction you could have. And he'll tell you what characters are involved in this particular issue. But then he would tell the top talent to do it, and they would all do it differently. Every, because every talent had been trained and come up in a different place, in a different territory, had wrestled multitudes of different people, established their own style, their own gimmick, their own look. Yes, the mighty Igor and Ivan Putsky did the same thing, but not at the same time in the same territory, in different parts of the country. And that's what made wrestling so different. You could go from territory to territory, and even if you were seeing the same guys, they looked different because they were selling different styles of wrestling. Or And I'm not talking about lucha and hardcore. I'm talking about is it brawling? Is it more athletic? Is it more technical work or whatever? We've talked about this. But everybody did the shit differently. And there was some parameters and rules of the road for what you couldn't do before you made the business complete horse shit. And those were enforced by the bookers and the promoters. And otherwise, the it, it that's why there was such variety and you enjoyed watching all these different people have all these different matches. But now it, it's like when they have these garbage, hardcore weapons matches or no DQ, lazy booking, stipulations out the ass, it's like everybody, no matter who they are, what they look like, what their background is or what their style is, are trying to be the Marx Brothers. Because they do the same shit. Everybody, you can call it. And I mean, I, 30 seconds into this thing, Seth was pulling out a kendo stick. After 45 seconds, they were out on the floor where the crowd was already chanting, we want tables because the furniture is more over in this situation than any of the talent. And then in two minutes, they peeled the pad off the floor and they were using the stairs. And we have suddenly, on this show, gone from a match that was all psychology to a match that's none. It's not even hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's not a sporting event. It's not even imitation wrestling. It's just guys going out and having a big-budget movie fight scene for 30 fucking minutes. After three minutes on the floor, then Seth throws the chairs and the garbage can in the ring and pulls out two tables and throws them in and sets that up, and then they go back out to the floor and walk fight around the ring. And then Nakamura gets foam nunchucks and hits Seth. <laughs> he hit him in the back, and he hit him in the legs with nunchucks. And then he drops the nunchucks on purpose to charge Seth and run into his boot. Brian, if you've got nunchucks in your fucking hand and nobody's stopping you from using them, you going to put him down to charge at the fucking guy? I wouldn't, and he seemed like a master of the nunchucks, too. So then they were the heel put the garbage can over the baby face and pinatas him with the stick 
That's backwards. That's what in a garbage match with the baby face does to the fucking heel in the comeback. Who wants to cheer the heel trying to bash fucking knock, uh, Rollins' head in? But that's what it was every modern indie garbage match, but with no blood and a slower p pace and a bigger budget. And it's just over and over. There's so much junk in the ring. They got to work and walk around it. First time they tried to run shaky through the table, it didn't break. Then the, they, they set a ladder up by the announcer's desk and teased a spot, but they'll come back to that. Then they went in the back of the arena, and here, Seth Rollins in the course of this match is going to take a bump on a real announcer's table off a ladder, and he's going to go through another real table at the finish, and they set up a crash pad so he could take a bump off the bleachers. They fight back to the, the back of the arena and up the stairs into the bleachers and get on the, and they've, they're showing you the crash pad on camera. And what else would it be? They've got a, a cloth over the top of it and, and black draping around the edge of it, but it is a completely open 12 by 12 foot surface, two feet off the ground with nothing sitting on it that can't, it is not at a place where it can be used as a stage, has no equipment setting on it, and coincidentally, they fight to the exact location when Seth gets knocked off the fucking bleachers, he falls on it and bounces. What was that supposed to be, Brian, besides a crash pad? Not a crash pad, a landing area, well, uh, a, uh, a, a platform, a interview platform. It... <laughs> It was on camera more than goddamn the wrestlers were. They wouldn't get it out of the shot. The only thing, when, when he landed on it, they had the cameras set just so that he would, you'd see his body bounce, but not what he landed on. Then he rolled off. Then they got the shot of him on the floor. But while they're shooting him on the floor, he's laying next to a crash pad. Can't take the, just don't take the bump. You already, you're taking other bumps through shit. You don't need to take an extra bump, especially on a crash pad. And at that point, I, I said, fuck it. I'm, I'm fast forwarding. I'm getting to the finish of this thing because I'm getting pissed because this it's just garbage. It, I can't, I can't say it doesn't take talent because being a stunt man in the movies takes talent, but there is nothing related to wrestling or the concept of wrestling, or what wrestling traditionally has been for a hundred years, from this, it's, this would be great as a three-minute angle, where they get out of control, and they fight around, and they take one of these bumps, but in 30 minutes with the sticks, and the cans, and the chairs, and the tables, and the phoniness, and the obvious cooperation, and at the end, finally, they, they broke a table, finally, then the, and they finally pushed Seth off the ladder and he went through the announce desk. And then they fought in the back of the arena again and they went through another fucking table. And that's when Seth finally won. 30 fucking minutes. Can you, can you eat the best filet mignon in the world for four fucking hours straight before you're tired of filet mignon? And this wasn't no fillet. This I could still see the marks where the jockey was beating this steak. Well, hopefully this is the end of the Nakamura Seth Rollins feud. And on the entrances, there's people that have fucking epileptic seizures that weren't jerking and twitching and convulsing like these two. Talk about a fucking complimentary gimmick. One guy fucking it looks like he's being electrocuted on the way to the ring. And then here comes the other guy, and he yeah. looks like he's wearing electric clothing. Yeah, the other guy saw that and said, hmm, that's a good idea. I should try that. Yeah. But I mean, I, I just, and they're risking injury. The more you give people this shit, the more they expect it. That's why now every time they see somebody pull out a weapon, they, screw, they ch start chanting for tables. In the territory days, you broke tables. But may in one in a particular town, maybe a couple times a year, and on TV, maybe the same. 
you, but now it's constant. It's it's a cliche. It's a parody. The furniture and the bullshit. That's what they have ruined the business by doing this so much because it gets the cheap pops that now people expect it rather than are thrilled with the anticipation of it. It's like if they didn't get it, they'd be disappointed. And that's the that's the worst psychology of all the bad psychology in wrestling today. If the people don't get excessive amounts of shit that you shouldn't do that much of, they'll feel disappointed because you've done it for so long. What the fuck? Well, that's that, my thoughts. That was fast lane. Five matches, three hours. 248 to be exact, I believe. Relatively painless, especially if you have the option to fast forward. Yeah, and, and again, you know, it wasn't a big show. It was a big show in name only. Nothing was offensive except for the last match, which is just fucking stupid. But they didn't make any ridiculous mistakes and the the points that they needed to make they got over it just it takes a long time as we've said this is completely a tale of neither one of the AEW or WWE products resembles professional wrestling anymore but they've gone in completely different directions but again we see which one is winning and by at ever widening margins so I got to go yeah. with that. They're going with the stars and the fucking budget. Hey, listen, no matter what you want to say, AEW returns to a town. The crowd is much smaller. WWE returns to a town right now. They're selling out. They're setting records everywhere they go. And boy, have p people's expectations lowered to this point where they're happy to go and watch these shows. The WWE shows, I mean, they're happy to go and sit there through three hours of Raw where almost nothing happens, and they get talked to for two of the three hours, and they pay more money than ever to do it. I wish it had been this easy to draw money when I was in the business, where we didn't actually have to go out and fucking act like we meant it and do exciting shit. Just go fucking cut promos for 25 minutes. That could have been my thing. And instead of people trying to attack you or getting mad at you, they could just stand there with a smile on their face and yell boo while you talk. Yes. That would have been any fun at all. I wouldn't have lasted fucking six months in the wrestling business if it was today because it would have, I would have fucking screamed and, and torn my hair out and said, I got to get away from this shit. Yes, yeah, the thing, too. People say, like, oh, look, that's a great example of Don Callis' heat. No, with Dominic Mysterio, because his character was a putz, it's a way of the crowd disrespecting someone they don't like. With Don Callis, it's a bunch of fans smiling, like, yeah, he's the bad guy. Let's boo him. That's not heat. Yeah, let's see about three or four drunk motherfuckers coming under the goddamn ropes at the same time to get you and see if you feel like that's the same kind of... Oh. Conan. Reaction as, as boo at you, Conan! Conan! <laughs> I think that's a, that's a little bit more trepidatious a position to be in than just the fans are booing over your live promo. I've, I've been in both situations, and the, the first one, the people coming under the ropes out of the crowd made me more nervous. All right, well, speaking of being nervous, are you nervous we got to do this thing again in two more days? No, because we have nothing to review. Maybe we'll review some uh, Scrum audio. We'll see. But we have fun topics and fun... What do you mean a few days? When are we... Did, uh, well... Did you did you say we'll review s a crummy audio or scrummy audio? Either or. Well, if it, it... Hey, what's scrummy to one is crummy to another. But this crummy program is about to come to an end. Final uh, quotes, Brian. Thoughts, final, suggestions, comments? My final quotes. I would like to go with Thoreau. No, uh, I don't. I don't have any final quotes here today. No, uh, we will see you on the drive-thru for more of the professionalism that you have come to know and love from the Jim Cornette podcast. Well, that's the close. See you guys. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye, bye, everybody.